Welcome to the Wednesday evening webinar of the college. We are bringing a new topic today in our usual webinar discussion rather than an acidic practice. When we are introducing on certain aspects of transmission practices, till two decades back, we all I may say not we alone, all over the world, people were happy, rather contented, if they could give one unit old blood, and that is considered as one of the best supplements during operative loss. And that scenario has changed in the last two decades. It is still changing. We moved over to blood conservation techniques, hemodilution when needed, Component therapy, as well as underloading with the fluids, and these sort of changes have come up. And we have selected some faculty who are working on this particular area to talk to you on the current transfer practices. More than that, we are introducing a transmission specialist, Dr. Ganesh Mohan from Bangalore, who is qualified in transmission medicine, and he'll be giving some perspectives on the changing scenario and probably he'll be answered your queries also later. And I introduce a moderators of the day. The main moderator is Dr. Ambarisha, who is well known to you all, even though he was missing from scene for the last 10 years. He was with Katsura Ambarisha College Manipal. Well, in the last 10 years, he was out of session. Now he has rejoined with the Rajana history at Bangalore. And he's a known faculty examiner, very good analysis of our knowledge, and a good presenter, good faculty, and represents the college and the self everywhere meetings. And welcome, Dr. Abrish, back to India. Thank you, sir. And the other one is Dr. Ganesh Mohan, who is with the Kasura Medical College. He's a transmission practice specialist. He studied and postgraduated from Mangalore. And now he's with the Kasura Medical College and he's looking after the blood bank and the transmission division of the college. And he's connected with the quality appraisal on the blood bank transmission practices. And welcome you, Ganesh, to this particular meeting. I request Thank you. Ambarisha and Ganesh Mohan to start the program and introduce the speakers one by one. And QA we will limit to the end. And today's the backbone is Sunny's new recruit, Dr. Ragesh Gar, who will be operating or who is the webinar master of the evening. Welcome, Ragesh. Over to you. Abhinish, please carry on. Thank you, sir. It is indeed an honor to be present. And um, when I left uh, 10 years back, that time I see it was in the infancy and it's your uh, brain child. And now we see the activities, academic activities that is done by ICA. Sir, really hats off to you. It is doing such a good academic program and I'm closely connected with the ICA programs. It is really helping the anesthesiologists as well as the postgraduates. So thank you, sir. And today's program, that is uh, one of the very important topics, blood transfusion. As Dr. Azakistan told, over the three decades, a lot of changes has happened in this evolution of uh, blood transfusion. As you all know, blood is one of the greatest uh, advances in the medical science. Over the centuries, if we see, blood has remained an indispensable life-giving force. Among all the advances that is there, blood is in the foremost because it is a vital and uh, it is a life-giving force and it has remained. And innumerable uh, patients have been saved by the blood transfusions. As perioperative physicians, we as anesthesiologists do maximum transfusions. And since the changes have taken over, 
ever since the blood cell separators came into existence and the various components of blood is available as well as now with the present in most of the countries including uk they do not use whole blood at all they are using only the components of the blood so ever since this components of blood is introduced and with the emergence of hiv infe uh, hiv infection lot of stimulus in the with regard to the hazards of blood transfusion and the awareness increased both in the medical professionals as well as in the consumers so now the blood transfusion that has been done earlier presently we should make the blood transfusion safe what do what do we mean by the safe transfusion practices with the evolution of the different components of the blood and the benefits and the risks of this transfusion we have to be serious and we have to weigh the risks and benefits before we should transfuse this empirical transfusion of the blood that practice which was there before that should stop first of all some few questions remain uns unanswered like for example the blood what we transfuse is the benefits outweigh the risk if the benefits outweigh then only probably it is we have to justify similarly what are the responsibilities of the anesthesiologists or the physicians perioperative physicians with regard to this transfusion and what is the role of the patients are we aware about the factors that is determining when these patients are exposed to the transfusion of erythrocytes and most important for most is whether this components what we transfuse whether the benefits and the risk we should weigh and just on the basis of the lab value transfusion should never be done transfusion is justified only when it done to save the lives so there is a lot of changes that has taken over which we are going to elaborate today we have a good panelist of speakers here and the first and the foremost what we have is the blood component and uh, that is going to be taken by dr vijesh venugopal who is mbbs md pdcc pgdem who is a professor and hod came city medical college calicut kerala he is the dnb academic coordinator came city medical college he has a vast experience more than 20 years he has a m number of publications in both international as well as national journals he has delivered a guest lectures number of guest lectures more than 30 His special interest is in quality control, then ECMO, then cardiac intensive care, and he has received COPS Best Award as well as Best Outgoing Student in the Exit Exam of the PGDEM. So I hereby introduce Dr. Vijesh Venugopal, sir. Now the forum is yours, and you can uh, present your talk on blood component therapy, one of the important topic what we are going to have now. That is. blood component therapy dr vijesh thank, you, yeah, thank yeah. you sir for that kind introduction i'll just share my screen sir i am visible and audible i believe yeah you are audible Yeah. At the outset, I would like to thank the Indian College of Anesthesiology for the opportunity to talk regarding blood component therapy. So, before we enter into the blood component therapy as such, uh, blood has fascinated mankind from uh, time immemorial. Egyptians have bathed in it, Romans have drank it, and modern medicine doctors tend to transfuse it. The first recorded attempt at blood transfusion. was in 1492 when pope innocent 7 was dying and his doctors attempted to save his life by giving him blood 
of three healthy young boys. The problem was doctors didn't understand the concept of intravenous circulation at that time. And so the hope was made to drink the blood. Ultimately, what resulted was in the mortality of all the people involved. All the three young healthy boys died as well as the Pope. And uh, later in 1650, uh, the circulation was, uh, was, uh, uh, was introduced or rather was discovered by William Harvey and he published it in his uh, book and thereby the interest in blood transfusion was reignited. And the first documented animal to animal blood transfusion was performed at Oxford in 1665 by Richard Lower. And this was followed by the first animal to human blood transfusion in 1667 by Jean Baptiste Denis. But this was followed by a lot of complications and hence the blood transfusion was banned by the church as well as by the uh, aristocracy. And almost 150 years there was no studies in blood transfusion and the first human to human blood transfusion was performed by Dr. James Blundell who was an obstetrician in 1818 for a postpartum hemorrhage case where the husband donated blood to the lady. And this was published in the Lancet Journal. However, in the year 1900, the ABO blood grouping system was classified by Carl Landsteiner. And based on this, the first pre-transfusion cross match was successfully done by Dr. Ruben Ottenberg at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York in 1907. And the RH system or RH typing was invented by Dr. Carl uh, Landsteiner and uh, Alexander Wiener in the year 1940. Along with it, in 1920s, the development of anticoagulation solutions, the citrate solution to store donated blood was introduced. And in 1951, Edwin Cohen from Boston and his colleagues developed the first blood cell separator and thereby gave birth to the blood component therapy. So for developing these blood components, we need to donate blood first. So the types of donations are, as we all know, allogenic and autologous, and also we have directed uh, blood donation. In directed blood donations, the relatives tend to donate blood for a specific designated individual. And the methods of blood collection are either you can use whole blood or by effervescence. So this is a picture showing blood donation by whole blood and whole blood is collected from the patient. And this is a picture of a patient being where blood is collected by effervescence. In effervescence technique, this machine works either on the principle of centrifugation, where the different uh, components based on their specific gravity is targeted and the components are separated or by the method of filtration where the size of the components are uh, manipulated and separate these components get separated but most of the machines use the centrifugation technique and uh, there are two in there are two types of uh, FRSs either it can be intermittent or continuous and in FRSs what they do is they take a, a, a part of the blood which is referred to as the extracorporeal blood volume and it is centrifuged and the uh, required component is collected and the remaining blood and components are returned back to the patient. In intermittent technique there is a single phlebotomy where the uh, blood is drawn from the patient and it is separated and the remaining components are given back into the same phlebotomy. Whereas in continuous effervescence what happens is there are two phlebotomies and from one uh, the blood is taken, the components are uh, segregated and the, suppose you want to take platelets, platelets are uh, collected and the remaining RBCs, plasma and the leukocytes are uh, reintroduced back into the uh, patient through the other arm. So this is a continuous and simultaneous process that takes place in, con in the continuous effervescence process. So the components that can be uh, taken out by effervescence are the pack cells, the plasma concentrates, sorry, the plasma, the uh, platelet concentrates, the granulocytes, and the hematopoietic progenitor cells. Now, how do you convert this whole blood into blood components? We use the refrigerated uh, centrifuge. And there are two main uh, techniques. Either you can use the platelet-rich plasma technique or the Buffy coat method. And the Buffy coat method is a better method, but it uh, is complicated and it requires automation. So the main components that you can get from the uh, blood whole blood is pack cells, platelet concentrates, that is the random donor platelets, the fresh frozen plasma, the cryoprecipitate, the cryopore plasma, and plasma fractionation. Now coming to plasma fractionation taken from, or it is um, made from the uh, plas from plasma, and uh, 
mainly it is the albumin and the immunoglobulins now briefly i would like to tell what happens in the uh, centrifuge a differential centrifugation is done what you see here is the mother bag and connected to it is two satellite bags and this is put into the it's a closed system and this is put into the centrifuge and first uh, there are two types of spin there it can be, it can undergo a heavy spin or a light spin so initially it's a light spin that is given and what happens is paxels get uh, accumulated here and the platelet rich plasma comes to the first satellite bag then the platelet the rbcs the paxels are then taken out and the platelet rich plasma undergoes a second heavy spin which is at approximately 3500 to 5000 depending on the manufacturer the centrifugal g force is applied and then it separates into platelet concentrate and plasma so that is how the differential centrifugation is done so coming to the blood components uh, individual blood components we see that we have the uh, paxels the paxels are uh, uh, there is an additive solution that is added it could be cpda if that is added it is around 63 ml or it could be the sagm that is a saline adenine glucose mannitol solution which is around 100 ml is added so you get a paxel is around volume of paxel is around 350 ml and the shelf life depends on the additive solution that is added if it is cpda it's around 35 days and for uh, uh, sagm it's around 42 days if it's stored at uh, 1 to 6 degrees centigrade it contains a small volume of plasma indications for rbc transfusion are for treatment of symptomatic anemia for prophylaxis in life threatening anemia for restoration of oxygen carrying capacity in case of severe hemorrhage and also they are indicated for exchange transfusion in case of sickle cell disease and severe methemoglobinemia and severe hyperbilirubinemia of the newborn now what is the decision to transfuse when is the medical decision to transfuse it depends upon the transfusion trigger now transfusion trigger it's defined as a particular hemoglobin level of discomfort in the prescribing physician and not defined by clear physiologic parameters according to bruce spees but this has been laid to rest by the transfusion requirements in critical care trial the trick trial which was published in the new england journal of medicine in 1999 by herbert and colleagues where they showed that a restrictive strategy of red cell transfusion is at least as effective and possibly superior to a liberal strategy in critically ill patients with the possible exception of patients with acute mi or unstable angina and this paper was uh, marked as the number one landmark study that has changed the practice of uh, transfusion medicine this was followed by around nine robust trials robust uh, rcts which have been which include the trip icu and the focus trials and this has been done over a wide variety of patients uh, micu patients critically ill uh, pediatric patients premature neonates uh, orthopedic patients and severe gi bleeding and all these have shown that a restrictive uh, strategy uh, of blood transfusion is going to improve the outcomes and this gave the impetus for almost five societies to bring out guidelines supporting a hemoglobin transfusion trigger of 7 to 8 grams per deciliter and also gave the impetus for the development of the patient blood management programs so in post operative patients if they are hemodynamically stable a transfusion trigger is around hemoglobin less than 8 grams per deciliter especially if there are symptoms of inadequate oxygen delivery this has a quality of evidence of high and a strength of recommendation is very strong the patients in the intensive care in normal volemic patients a hemoglobin level of less than 7 grams per deciliter is considered to be the hemoglobin trigger in sepsis in the early resuscitative phase Uh, the the target hemoglobin is around 9 to 10 grams per deciliter here the quality of evidence is low and the strength of recommendation is also weak but in the later phases of severe sepsis the hemoglobin target of around 7 to 9 grams per deciliter is advised so in the early resuscitative phase you have to keep a higher hemoglobin level what about in cardiac disease in hemodynamically stable patients a trigger of less than 8 grams per deciliter is considered and also in stable angina a uh, hemoglobin trigger is around 7 grams per deciliter whereas if the patient has suffering from acute coronary syndrome the hemoglobin trigger is a uh, hemoglobin of less than 8 grams per deciliter what about the neurotrauma and neurological diseases in traumatic brain injury especially if there is an evidence of cerebral ischemia the target is to be kept more than 9 grams per deciliter in subarachnoid hemorrhage again more than 8 
And in acute ischemic stroke, it is supposed to be kept more than nine. But all, in all these studies, it has been shown that the quality of evidence is low and the strength of recommendation is weak. So you can say that appropriate management would be to have a hemoglobin threshold of less than seven grams per deciliter in stable non-bleeding patients for symptomatic anemias. However, it can be made as less than eight grams per deciliter for patients with acute coronary syndrome with ischemia and traumatic brain injury with intracranial hypertension. Now coming to the next product that is plasma. This is prepared from a single unit of donated whole blood. The mean volume is around 250 mils and when frozen, it can be stored for a year if the temperature is maintained less than 18 degrees centigrade, minus 18 degrees centigrade. The fresh frozen plasma contains all the factors of soluble coagulation system, including factor five and eight, which are labile. And uh, fibrinogen content is around two grams if you give four units of uh, FFP. The fresh frozen plasma should be the same group as the patient and the recommended therapeutic dose is around 15 milliliters per kilogram. The varieties of plasma that are available are fresh frozen plasma where the plasma is separated from the whole blood by centrifugation should be frozen within eight hours of collection. And there is another product that is fresh frozen plasma, fresh, uh, fresh plasma 24. That is, it is frozen beyond eight hours, but less than 24 hours of collection. This was used in the United Kingdom to prevent uh, transfusion related acute lung injury. And the third type of plasma is the thawed plasma. Now thawing of plasma, how do you do that? It can be done by using a dry oven where you keep it for 10 minutes, microwave for two to three minutes or in a water bath, which is commonly used for 20 minutes. The, fresh, the plasma should be thawed between 30 and 37 degree with constant agitation. Now this thawed plasma has, can be used for up to 24 hours as long as it is stored at four degrees centigrade. But this time has been extended recently to five days uh, if stored at four degrees centigrade. Now, once out of the fridge, it must be used within 30 minutes and once thawed, it should never be refrozen. So the indications are a customary dose of 10 to 15 mils per kilogram, replacement of coagulation factors during major hemorrhage, particularly trauma and obstetrics, acute uh, DIC with uh, bleeding. In patients who are actively bleeding and whose uh, INR is more than 1.7 or a point of care equivalent is there. For immediate reversal of warfarin-induced hemorrhage when uh, prothrombin complex is not available uh, because it is the first choice. And in thrombocytopenic purpura, usually with plasmapheresis and in uncommon uses for replacement of coagulation factors when specific factors are not available. Coming to the third, the next uh, uh, blood component that is platelet concentrates. Platelets, they are prepared by centrifugation of individual units of whole blood. And these are referred to as random donor platelets. Now, single units of platelets are around 60 to 75 mils, and they can then be pooled immediately before release to obtain one therapeutic adult dose, which is around four to six units of these single units. FRSS platelets, platelets are often called as single donor platelets, and they are collected from a donor by selectively removing the platelets. Now, this technique allows collection of a larger quantity of platelets around 250 in a 250 ml bag with minimum platelets of 3 to 10 to the power of 11 platelets. Now the sh shelf life of a platelet is platelet concentrate is only five days. Why is it only five days? Because they are stored at 22 degrees centigrade with constant gentle agitation in an approved incubator. This agitation is to prevent the clumping of uh, these platelets. Now platelets should never be placed in a refrigerator and transfusion should ideally be commenced within 30 minutes of removal from the platelet storage incubator. And transfusion should lead to an increase in the patient's platelet count by approximately 30,000 per millimeter cube. Now, indications are prevention and treatment of bleeding due to thrombocytopenia or platelet uh, dysfunction. If plate patient is actively bleeding, you can transfuse to a platelet count of more than uh, 75,000 per millimeter cube. Now, there are certain triggers for giving platelets. If you are planning to give a neuroaxial blockade, the suggested trigger is if the platelets are less than 50, you can prophylactically, uh, 50,000 per millimeter cube, you can prophylactically give platelets. And another indication is major surgery or invasive procedures, again, less than 50. 1,000 per millimeter cube, they tend to give platelets. But in close compartment surgery, we tend to have a threshold of around less than 75,000. However, if you look at the uh, recommendation, the recommendation they state that even up to 30,000, when the platelet count goes uh, below 30,000, uh, the platelet uh, uh, transmission is indicated. 
Coming to cryoprecipitate, it is prepared from one unit of donated FFP. The FFP is taken and kept within the refrigerator and is thawed overnight at one to six degrees centigrade. And then the next day, it is uh, the, after the thawing, overnight thawing, it is taken and put into uh, the uh, refrigerator centrifuge where it is maintained at four degrees centigrade. And a, a spin is given at around uh, 2000 G. And what precipitate uh, the supernatant is discarded and the precipitate is taken and this is the cryoprecipitate and this volume is around 20 mils and it contains fibrinogen of around 200 to 250 milligrams per unit the adult dose is five such units and it comes to around 100 ml in volume this contains factor 8 von willebrand factor and factor 13 the clinical indications are mainly hypo hypofibrinogenemia that is less than uh, 150 milligrams per deciliter due to major hemorrhage and massive transfusion. So the idea is to keep your uh, fibrinogen levels during major hemorrhage to more than 150 milligrams per deciliter. And in obstetric hemorrhage, the fibrinogen level should be maintained more than 200 milligrams per deciliter. It's also indicated in dysfibrinogenemia, in advanced liver disease, in uremic bleeding that is unresponsive to desmopressin. So these are a few indications. Another indication is bleeding associated with thrombolytic therapy. Finally, coming to granulocyte concentrate. Granulocyte concentrate is nowadays obtained only by automatic method from a single donor by FRSS. It is indicated only in life-threatening bacterial and fungal infections in patients with severe neutropenia, that is below 500 uh, cells per millimeter cube. And trans there is no role for prophylactic granulocyte concentrate transfusions. What about in pediatric patients? In pediatric patients or the neonates or the infants, the requirement is 10 to 15 milliliter per kilogram. And these patients might require only 25 to 100 ml of blood. And they may also require multiple transfusions. So this, what we can do is we can take an adult PRBC unit of around 300 ml and then uh, aliquot it into pedi packs of 50 ml each. And the, the child can be given multiple transfusions. So this will avoid multiple donor exposures to the patient. And so that is the advantage of using pedi packs. Now, coming to the uh, recommendation in pediatrics, in pediatrics, a transfusion of 10 ml per kilogram of RBC should increase the hemoglobin by approximately 2 grams per deciliter. Cryoprecipitate is given with a dose of 5 to 10 ml per kilogram, platelets in dose of 10 to 20 ml per kilogram, and uh, fresh frozen plasma in the dose of 10 to 15 ml per kilogram. Here, we don't uh, recommend giving uh, doses in uh, uh, packs, but it is mentioned in volume. Now coming to modified blood products, modified blood products are uh, given so that these foreign particles, the leukocytes and the proteins, which can cause reactions, uh, can be removed. So the modifications that are done are saline wash products, leuco-reduced products, irradiated products, and pathogen inactivated products. Now coming to saline washed products here, what they do is for RBCs, they take the packed red blood cells and then dilute it with double the amount of uh, the uh, saline and then put it into the centrifuge and wash it for three to four cycles till the supernatant is clear. So usually at least three to four cycles are given. So here the plasma antibodies are removed. So this is indicated for IgA deficient patients with class specific anti-IgA bodies, IgA antibody. It's also done for removal of plasma proteins if the if it is associated, if the transfusions has been associated with severe allergic transfusion reactions, then washed RBCs are indicated. The issue with washing is you lose around 20% of your RBC mass. And if it is done in an open system, these manually washed RBC should be used within 24 hours. But if you use a closed automated washed RBC system, these can be resuspended in 100 ml of SAGM solution and can be kept for a shelf life of 14 days but the preservative anticoagulant is lost and it compromises the cell viability and function of these washed RBCs. The next one that you can do is a leuco-reduced cellular blood components. Now, it can be done either pre-storage or pre-transfusion. In pre-storage, immediately after your uh, donation, within 48 hours, you can do an immediate filtration. And they use... Uh, different types of leukocyte uh, filters and the advantage if you do it pre-storage is that uh, the leukocyte, the cytokine release has not happened. So uh, it will be 100% protective. And so this is done on the lab side and you need uh, trained staff for doing it. So this adds to probably adds to the cost of the product. 
but pre transfusion is a bedside procedure this is done by spiking the blood component bag with specialized transfusion set having leukocyte filter with continuous leuco reduction during transfusion but here since it's a stored blood the effect of cytokines cannot be avoided if you use a pre transfusion leuco depletion now this is indicated in uh, preventing or rather it decreases the incidence of platelet transfusion of refractoriness due to hla aluminization as was shown in the trap trial it provides cmv safe rbcs it prevents the febrile non hemolytic transfusion reactions and it decreases the incidence of hla aluminization in non hepatic solid organ transplant it is preferred in all neonatal and pediatric transfusions for children less than a year so what it does is it effectively reduces the um count of your wbcs the residual wbc in a leuco reduced fourth generation unit is less than 10 to the power of 5 wbc per unit the next thing that you can do is the uh, radiation irradiated uh, blood cells what it does is it prevents the transfusion associated graft versus host disease the sole reason is to kill the proliferative potential of nucleic wbcs by cross linking of the dna the dose that is applied is around 2500 grads or 25 gray the fda recommends a 28 day expiration period for irradiated rbcs now it is done for pediatric population when an intrauterine transfusion is advised neonatal ecmo very low birth weight infants and for neonatal exchange transfusion the non pediatric uh, indications are bone marrow failure states myelo proliferative syndromes stem cell transplant recipients and for all direct donors because they are relatives so it is better to kill these uh, cells to prevent uh, transfusion associated graft versus host disease the other technique is to preserve these cells is by giving by doing a cryopreservation so you can cryopreserve by using either glycerol or the dimethyl sulfoxide uh, so the rbcs are uh, cryopreserved using 40% glycerol and if you it can be stored for 10 years if the storage temperature is maintained below 80 degrees centigrade for the platelets single donor platelets can be uh, preserved for 2 years if it is stored at minus 80 degrees centigrade after treatment with 6% uh, dmso ffp can stored for 14 years at minus 80 degrees centigrade and peripheral blood hematopoietic stem cells can be stored for up to 1 to 2 years after treatment with 10% dmso at minus 80 degree centigrade so all these are stored at minus 80 degree centigrade there are certain special blood components the prothrombin complex concentrate the fibrinogen concentrate in the platelet gel the prothrombin complex concentrate has basically four factor concentrates factor 2 7 9 and 10 and it is indicated in acquired factor deficiency and for urgent reversal of warfarin the fibrinogen concentrate is uh, licensed in united kingdom for use in congenital hypofibrinogenemia the platelet gel is used in reconstructive and orthopedic procedures here what they do is they add thrombin and calcium to the prp making it a gelatin like material and it is uh, given in different names like fibrin glue platelet fibrin glue so the coming to the storage of these blood components the red cells are stored between 2 to 6 degree centigrade the platelets and leukocytes are at room temperature 20 to 24 degree and the plasma products are below minus 18 degree centigrade and the cold chain should be uh extended to the to the point of transfusion so there are the different types of refrigerators for storage of whole blood prbc and storage of clot plasma where the temperature is maintained at 4 to 6 degree centigrade the platelet incubators are maintained at 22 to 24 degree centigrade with an agitation speed of around 60 cycles per minute freezers at minus 40 degree centigrade for storing plasma products and deep freezers for your uh, uh for cryo preserved products you want to monitor the blood therapy you have different lab values that can be monitored cnr and apt but these have a very slow turnaround time dynamic clinical situation so we have to have point of thromboelastometry the thromboelastogram which have a shorter turnaround time and we have different uh, algorithms for uh, giving different products and uh, we have different signature yeah. patterns on the rotem and as well as on sonoclot so we can decide what now coming to finally coming to the complications of blood transfusion complications are 
many but uh, transfusion is a set of processes so it's not just a blood product so there are many processes involved so they are error prone and we should try to give the right blood to the right patient at the right time at the right place so this should be the motto of blood transfusion and we all know that the stored blood has lot of storage lesions there is build up of cytokines free hemoglobin potassium and there is decreased 2 3 dpg and also there is poor deformability leading to decreased oxygen exchange and if you look at various studies you see it is shown that the in hospital mortality the acute incidence of acute renal failure as well as the length of stay all increases as the age of the blood transfused is increased so the stored rbcs result in significantly malperfused and underoxygenated microvasculature and can contribute to multi organ failure so coming to the transfusion complications can be divided as acute and chronic the acute ones are the hemolytic reactions the febrile reactions the allergic reactions pralli coming to acute hemolytic reaction this results from mistransfusion of uh, abo incompatible red cells and it leads to a lot of uh, errors and it can be fatal uh, its symptoms are mainly high fever chills hypotension oliguria dark urine pallor and the what to do in such a situation is to stop transfusion maintain the abc of the patient give uh, maintain iv access and obtain blood and urine for transfusion reaction workup and send the remaining blood back to the blood bank coming to the febrile uh, non hemolytic transfusion reactions these occur in, in around 1% of rbc and around 20% of platelet transfusion because platelets are stored at around 22 degree centigrade and uh, in such conditions what to do is to stop transfusion you can use antipyretics like paracetamol you can use narcotics for preventing the chills <coughs> corticosteroids for severe reactions coming to allergic non hemolytic uh, react transfusion reactions this could be because of the plasma proteins the patient will present with urticaria and wheezing and the treatment is again to stop the transfusion and to uh, give supportive care with steroids and antihistamines coming to this uh, relatively uh, important uh, uh, transfusion reaction that is trialy trialy occurs because of the anti hla and anti granulocyte antibodies in the donor plasma which attack the recipient wbc there is complement activation which leads to pulmonary leukostasis and endothelial damage and capillary leak in lungs so this is how the trialy picture looks like there is a clinical syndrome similar to ards it occurs 1 to 6 hours after receiving plasma containing products is more common when you receive blood from multiparous female donors and the treatment is supportive with lung protective ventilation if required massive transfusion again can cause uh, transfusion uh, associated cardiac or circulatory overload you have electrolyte uh, abnormalities like binding of calcium by citrate and also you have hyperkalemia due to breakdown of stored rbcs bacterial contamination is more common in the platelets and coming to chronic transfusion reactions the most important one would be the trans the graft versus host disease this is happens when there is immuno, infusion of immunocompetent cell the lymphocyte from the donor into the recipient where two factors have to be satisfied the patient should either be immuno immuno suppressed or the patient should have some matching hla antigens between the donor and the recipient as seen in directed transfusions so here there is proliferation of donor t lymphocytes it gets engrafted into the bone marrow of the recipient and there is proliferation of the donor t lymphocytes and these will attack the patient's tissue so this is mainly seen in infants bmt uh, bone marrow transplant patients this severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome and uh, the symptoms are multi systematic and uh, multi system as well as this uh, cutaneous involvement it is usually fatal there is no treatment so the prevention is to give irradiation of the donor cells in patients at risk transfusion associated infections we know them and coming to transfusion and outcomes there are a lot of studies in different uh, varieties of population all these studies have shown that there is higher post op mortality and higher post op morbidity with uh, and infectious complications with blood transfusion and in all of these studies hemoglobin was has been increased after transfusion in almost 80% of studies the delivery of oxygen increased but in 16% of the studies the consumption increased in none of these studies did ischemia improve as measured by lactate in all of these studies transfused patients had poor outcomes so we have the choosing wisely campaign by the society for advancement of blood management and they say that we should not proceed for elective surgery in patients with anemia and not to perform unnecessary tests not to transfuse plasma 
use techniques which will prevent transfusion and as far as possible avoid transfusion now finally what is the role for whole blood now whole blood the role is mainly in military practice where the indication for stored whole blood is life threatening hemorrhage and this life assessment of life uh, hemorrhage which is life threatening is mainly established clinically so they say that more than 40 to 50% of blood loss they would prefer to give uh, uh, low titer o o group whole blood now the use of fresh whole blood should be reserved for when the stored blood is unavailable or the full complement therapy is unavailable blood complement therapy in the ratio 1 is to 1 is to 1 is an acceptable option for treating life threatening hemorrhage in military practice now some words or two slides on blood donation during covid pandemic there are a lot of confusion among the blood donors because they are worried whether we have to go in for a covid 19 test before blood donation and whether social distancing can be maintained during blood donation and whether the uh, whether you will get um, covid 19 through blood donation so these should be uh, told to the patient that uh, uh, there is no risk of contracting covid 19 through blood donation process however you should know that it is not recommended to donate blood if in the past 20 to 28 days if you have had covid 19 or you have been exposed to covid 19 or if you have traveled to an area where covid 19 is uh, there and also it has been now uh, now an order has been passed by the national blood transfusion council that no blood donation for 28 days after the last jab of your covid 19 vaccine so those of the 18 to 45 years people who have not donated blood should preferably donate blood before getting the jab of vaccination so finally a publication in jama in 1937 said that as blood transfusions are trying and even dangerous procedure to the recipient the indications for it should be drawn strictly and rather narrowly so 75 years down the line we are saying the same thing so what's old is new again i would like to conclude by saying that blood transfusion is like marriage it should not be entered upon lightly unadvisedly or wantonly or more often than is absolutely necessary as quoted by robert bill in his publication in the australian new zealand journal of surgery thank you very much for the kind attention thank you dr vijeshwan gopal and um, since this topic was very important for uh, practicing anesthesiologists and postgraduate See, even though the time was running out i thought it is important so that is why let us hear it and uh, as it is very well clear now that uh, the rationale for whole blood transfusion is almost uh, nil very as i told it is only in the military for life saving where you give and even otherwise also the trigger for transfusion has really changed just on the laboratory values and correction of anemia going with transfusion is not recommended until unless patient has a comorbidity or there is poor peripheral organ perfusion and on that basis probably the transfusion should be decided not on the laboratory values empirical blood transfusion should be procedure should be stopped which uh, few of uh, the still practicing that should change because the hazards of transfusion are more so we should weigh the risks and benefits and do it any of the questions we will keep it towards the end and because the time is running out i doctor i ask you doctor um, uh, ganesh mohan to introduce the second speaker uh, you can and uh, take over thank you very much sir uh, it was a pleasure uh, listening to dr vijish uh, talk Uh, however i would like to add one point uh, towards it uh, because today nbtc has released a circular that post covid vaccination uh, the deferral period is only 14 days it came out today only so we can update on that it was 28 days previously but by today evening they uh, updated the circular by saying that it is 14 days because as per uh, as of now in india we don't have any live attenuated vac- covid vaccine it is all uh, killed vaccine so it is 14 days now moving on uh, now we should see uh, what are the perioperative bleeding ma- perioperative screening of patients uh, to see or identify patients who are at risk of bleeding because uh, unless we screen and diagnose patients who are at risk of bleeding they may end up having a massive uh, hemorrhage on ot so uh, i would like to welcome dr rajesh uh, who is uh, who is the academic coordinator in baby memorial hospital calicut 
who has won corps award and member editorial board of indian journal of anesthesia as well as associate editor kerala isa journal the uh, kerala isa journal and he has more than 30 international and national publications to his credit uh, without any further delay i welcome you sir to the talk thank you dr ganesh and at the outset uh, i should thank the office bearers of the isa especially professor radhakrishnan sir uh, my friend my friends uh, dr uh, rakesh garg and dr sanish for for us to introduce into the session it's a pleasure to uh, be in this august audience among academicians so uh, i will uh, start my uh, talk uh, by a quote from my late professor professor jayaram panika sir that blood is a poison the more i read about this topic i am really convinced that it is true is the screen visible yeah yeah thank you yes sir you can put it in slide show yeah thank you thank you so we will go to the topic and we will first uh, discuss about the what is patient blood management because it's not a new concept it is there for in the last 12, uh, 12 years and what are the pre operative measures and intra operative uh, techniques and post op strategies to reduce the intra operative blood loss and prevent coagulopathy patient blood management is nothing but the evidence based bundle of care to optimize medical and surgical patient outcome by clinically managing and preserving a patient's blood and uh, the previous speaker has said the assaults of blood and blood uh, blood component therapy so it is uh, it has to be used wisely in a very strict manner in a very strict protocolized based theme so uh, the the main pillars is to maintain the hemoglobin concentration optimize intraoperative hemostasis as well as in the perioperative uh, post operative period and minimize blood loss in the perioperative period so the main focus is to optimize the red cell cell mass and erythropoiesis before operation and to minimize the blood loss in in the intraoperative period and management of post operative anemia and edge, and very importantly educate and promote the availability of transfusion alternatives among the perioperative physicians and those involved in the care of the patient in the surgical unit so you have to uh, see the patient early uh, as a perioperative physician the anesthetist has to uh, detect and treat the perioperative anemia uh, they have to take the lead role in that and in uh, if for the patient scheduled for a major surgery uh, with high transfusion probability and uh, he has to opt for whatever technique he has to minimize the blood loss and intensify the use of blood conservating measures and it has to be continued in the post operative period also and rational and uh, evidence based guided appropriate unit of allogeneic blood products if at all required so this is an interesting article with a uh, title drivers for change that is after the establishment of uh, practicing uh, blood uh, uh, conservation technique uh, that is the the article has come from the western australia in page in uh, after they they have established the patient blood management program and they have seen that intraoperative transfusion rates has come down drastically and even when transfused they have used it less blood products than used in the uh, in the same scenario previously and it has definitely reduced the hospital stay and spread the uh, spread of uh, potential complications on the contrary Uh, uh, we still have to do a lot of uh, um, teaching among among ourselves in the among the perioperative physicians about the uh, techniques of patient blood management and the importance of correcting the perioperative anemia because this is an eye opening study which was published in 2015 uh, this uh, study is known as Pre prepare that is the prevalence of perioperative anemia and need for patient blood management in elective orthopedic sur surgery and multi center observation study though it's an observation study it, it involves a wide group of patients and it was done on elective orthopedic uh, patients on multi center study in europe and uh, they have found that 
anemia definitely increase the intraoperative transfusion and post op complications if the anemia is not corrected mind you it is done on elective settings not in emergency settings and if pharmacological treatment of anemia used randomly in all these uh, scenarios and rbc transfusion is overused so that means we have to educate a lot uh, among ourselves so uh, anesthesiologist has a key role in the preoperative settings intraoperative and postoperative and uh, we'll discuss all this in the coming thing so we have to take the meticulous history about the bleeding history and uh, which will help us to uh, stratify the risk of uh, uh, intraoperative bleeding and the need for components and uh, it will uh, help us to manage Uh, the anticoagulant and the antiplatelet therapies they suppose a lot of patients come to us with the uh, uh, anticoagulant and antiplatelet uh, drugs and we have to take a detailed history and uh, uh, we have to follow the guidelines about the stoppage of anticoagulants and antiplatelet uh, therapy and wherever needed we have to employ bridging therapy and restart the drugs uh, after the surgery so that has to be followed ac- strictly according to the guidelines and uh, detection of and management of the preop anemia that is the most important thing and the surgical team need to appreciate that anemia is a contraindication for major elective procedures so in the preoperative history you have to go through excessive surgical history there is a structured questionnaires available i will come to that and uh, response to hemostatic challenges in the past whether they have undergone a surgery or a trauma and what was the uh, outcome during the procedure whether they have excessively bled during procedure on the post operative period uh, any family history of bleeding disorders and use of antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy in the past and uh, if there is a negative uh, results or negative test routine coagulation test is not uh, recommended that is the evidence now suppose the patient has a positive history and uh, he has to uh, go for a quantitative description and refer to hematologist there, there is a international society of thrombus hemato and hemolysis uh, bleeding assessment tool vincenza bleeding uh, score and pediatric bleeding questionnaire these are uh, nothing but a structured questionnaire to assess the bleeding and the bleeding history and uh, like uh, epistaxis menorrhagia trauma and uh, uh, and uh, hemiarthrosis hemorthrosis and uh, um, bleeding from the gums and the bleeding during the dental extraction and all these are given a, uh, like a scoring system so if this is significant you have to refer to a hematologist or transfusion physician so and there is a surgery specific risk scores also like for in cardiac surgery or in a major uh, replacement surgeries and uh, like uh, the acta port score for the or uh, papworth bleeding risk score so you look into the age sex body surface area and preoperative hemoglobin and creatinine levels and the type of surgery and the duration of surgery and um, uh, how major the surgical procedure is and uh, it is uh, it it helps to identify and the modifiable risk factors and quantify the risk before surgery and it also helps to allocate our resources and the blood service inventory management so european society of uh, anesthesiologists recommend uh, we should see the patient for to eight uh, uh, weeks before surgery for a major procedure but may not be feasible most of the time but uh, we have to uh, take a lead role in seeing the uh, in the preoperative preparation of the patient uh, anesthesiologist and uh, it is definitely seen that the anemic patients increase the risk of preoperative complications and which is proportional to the severity of anemia they have and uh, the important is it is a 100% modifiable risk factor and uh, preoperative transfusion is a indica- independent uh, predictor of complications as a, as far as possible we have to avoid preoperative transfusion and go to alternative tra- techniques because the blood transfusion doesn't address the cause of anemia the patient may have uh, anemia due to different uh, reasons like microcytic anemia in iron deficiency or they have b12 or folate deficiency or the patient may be coming 
the surgical cause itself may be the reason for anemia. So you have to address the cause and uh, treat it there itself. So uh, the most uh, often um, uh, used management strategy, which is because of the economic considerations is the oral iron therapy. For that, you have to start the patient on oral iron four to six weeks before uh, the scheduled day for optimal efficiency. But uh, oral iron therapy has got its own limitations. Like uh, there is a significant uh, um, so reduction in the bioavailability and there is a significant GI side effects. Like 25 to 30% of the patients may not tolerate oral iron therapy and the bioavailability is poor. But it's still considered as the first line because of uh, it's a cheap and effective and it is uh, uh, harmless. Uh, suppose the patient is not tolerating oral iron, the next line, and you have time pressure, the next line of treatment is intravenous iron therapy. Uh, you have newer preparations like uh, ferric carboxylase, uh, carboxymaltose, which replace uh, the requirement in a single dose. And response is noted in five days with the peak effic efficacy in two to four weeks time but you have to be aware of serious adverse effects in one in two lakh. But uh, at this juncture, I should uh, uh, comment about uh, one study which, which was published in 2020 October, which is known as PREVENT study, that is preoperative intravenous iron to treat anemia before major abdominal surgery, which is a randomized double-blind control study it is a well conducted study, but uh, the results are quite baffling and it is uh, contrary to our present understanding about iron therapy and preoperative anemia, because they have not, uh, they have seen that correction of anemia 10 to 42 days before elective major surgery uh, with respect to reducing blood transfusion or death and uh, perioperative period, which has got uh, no uh, advantage over a placebo therapy. So it is quite baffling, but uh, there's only a, a single study I have seen uh, against uh, iron therapy, but most of the studies are for iron therapy and the test book recommendation is to continue iron therapy and correct anemia. So uh, because of that, there is a 2021 anesthesia, the, uh, an interesting editorial as uh, written by EF Miles, the end of the beginning, preoperative intravenous iron and preventive trial. So that means uh, uh, it is based on the previous study I have quoted. So there is a huge scope for uh, study in this settings about the uh, requirement of preoperative iron therapy and it is a, a still an uncharted territory. Another uh, option is that a preoperative erythropoiesis stimulating agent and uh, this uh, interesting uh, st study came in the transfusion. A single dose erythropoietin reduces perioperative transfusion in cardiac surgery. Uh, results of a prospective single blind randomized control study. And uh, they have used the uh, Darby poietin alpha. And we know it is, uh, uh, we are using it uh, in the chronic kidney patients uh, to correct anemia. Uh, uh, um, well, well taught at all, a sign that uh, a single dose two days prior as, uh, is effective in bringing up the uh, hemoglobin level in patients scheduled for surgery. But evidence is lacking in other perioperative conditions. And mind you, you have to think of uh, the complications also with the uh, erythrocyte stimulating agents like hypertension and increased thrombotic events. And the NICE guidelines does not recommend to uh, the preoperative ESA to reduce blood transfusion requirement. And uh, nowadays, many of the patients come to us with the anticoagulant, anti antiplatelet therapy, and uh, uh, you have to uh, take a detailed history and uh, should know about the disease conditions for which they have started the anticoagulants and uh, uh, what are these pharmacological agents, what is the duration of action, and what is the site of action, whether they are direct uh, newer generation, direct thrombin inhibitors, et cetera, and when, to, and what, how, when and want to start the bridging therapy uh, before surgery and after surgery. There is a lot of uh, guidelines like uh, American Society of Region Anesthesiologists and uh, uh, um, 
British guidelines to guide us for the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland guidelines about the um, uh, about this. And uh, uh, you should be aware of the specific antidotes and the anticoagulants. And uh, some uh, now there is uh, two new drugs. I just mentioned about these agents because uh, uh, most of us will be using it in future. Also, there's an uh, antidote for direct thrombin in inhibitors, idarosumab, and the uh, anti antioxidant alpha for the direct oral anticoagulant agents. But uh, we have to be aware of the thrombotic risk by using these agents. And uh, mind you, the surgery is always a hypercoagulable state. So you have to use it, these agents very judiciously. And uh, the surgeon uh, is, uh, has also uh, a lot of uh, things to do in the periodic settings. He has to time the surgery when the hematological tests are optimized, when the anemia is corrected and not to rush in an elective procedures. The tourniquet, use of tourniquet, uh, we have seen that in the limb surgeries, really increases the visibility uh, for the surgeon, but uh, it can increase the tourniquet pain and uh, thrombotic events and the quadriceps uh, weakness in the post-operative period. That also has to be taken into consideration. The antifibrinogenic agents, as especially the tranexamic acid, my uh, doctor friend, Dr. Kishore, will be speaking more about on these agents. The role is now well established following the CRASH-2 trial and Bowman trial. And uh, cell salvage technique in combination with other uh, anesthetic technique is very useful in the, when the facilities is available. The putting lot of drains is now questioned as a surgical strategy to uh, drain the blood and secretions because uh, some studies show, recent studies show that it actually increases the blood loss. And uh, laparoscopic and robotic surgeries, so also the endovascular surgeries greatly reduces the blood requirement and the blood loss. And the use of modern day diathermy and topical agents. So also the tumescent adrenaline containing local anesthetic agents along with general anesthesia. So uh, intraoperative cell salvage, it's a useful technique when facilities are available, but uh, you have to be very careful in using this te technique. Uh, the NICE guidelines uh, uh, tell that uh, you are, uh, in the anticipated loss of 20% or more than 20% of more blood loss, you can employ for or cell salvage technique if the facility is available. Uh, or when the uh, cost match compatible blood loss is unobtainable, uh, and in for or pa patients, a type of patients who are not willing for allogenic uh, uh, blood, like a uh, house witness, and the uh, uh, procedure is likely to have more than one unit of RBCs in the intraoperative setting. But uh, you require 500 to, uh, sorry. And uh, here the play, uh, play, uh, patient's uh, blood is collected from the field with uh, double lumen suction catheters. Along with that, heparinized saline is used. It comes to the reservoir and it washed with the saline and the washed RBC is transfused back to this patient. So the cycle is not break. So may, it may be uh, the, some of the AOHOS fitness patients, it may be an acceptable technique. But uh, you require 500 to 700 of collected blood to prepare uh, 225 to 250 ml of salvaged saline suspended packed uh, red blood concentrates. And the hematocrit is around 50 to 60%. Air embolism is a fatal problem. And uh, so also sometimes the blood may be uh, contaminated with the parentally incompatible uh, chemicals like betadine or chlorhexidine or some other chemicals. And hemolysis is a, a concern. Permissive hypotension, we anesthetists are familiar with that, but uh, indications are come down definitely. But it is a useful technique. Uh, urgent. Uh, uh, it's a useful uh, tool in the armamentarium of anesthesiologists to reduce the blood loss. You reduce the MAPT to 50 to 65 percent, uh, 65 millimeters of mercury. But definitely, uh, our main concern is to maintain the organ perfusion. So we have to balance it against the risk of organ perfusion, and uh, uh, it, uh, patient selection should be very meticulous. It, uh, you have to be very careful in coronary artery disease patients or poorly controlled blood pressure or cerebrovascular disease. 
another technique is the central neuroaxial anesthesia which uh, reduces the blood loss uh, and uh, patient positioning uh, wherein where you maintain adequate venous drainage we usually um, um, we have seen that during spine procedures when we position the patient uh, um, we do, when we do not position the patient properly there is there will be venous engorgement in the spinal uh, epidural uh, uh, venous plexus and there is induced oozing and uh, we, uh, patient position can be used along with alteration of physiology in, uh, like in liver surgeries or functional endoscopic surgeries endoscopic sinus surgeries to have a good so optimal field and reduce the blood loss and the fibrinolytic agents i have mentioned and uh, european recommendation european society of anesthesia recommendation is to use it wherein you anticipate more than 500 ml of blood loss and uh, another technique is acute normovolic hemodilution technique whenever the facility is available and the point of care uh, coagulation test with the uh, viscoelastographic method like a tech and rotum is now increasingly being used in cardiac and uh, liver surgeries and now it is being extended to obstetric hemorrhage and trauma patients also because you can prescribe the your uh, blood components exactly tailored to the patient's need avoiding hypothermia is an important uh, uh, hypothermia is an important concern in the intraoperative settings and uh, we have to take every step to avoid hypothermia you have to uh, do fluid warmer active forced air warming and uh, you have to maintain the body temperature about 36 degrees centigrade and there are certain set of patients uh, who are very uh, uh, it is very critical like the patients with extremes of age or patients for coming for major surgical procedures which uh, applies even to endo, um, like laparoscopic procedures or patients with higher asa fitness uh, and uh, you know that hypothermia leads to coagulopathy and acidosis and it is a lethal triage and uh, we should uh, take every steps to prevent the hypothermia and the lethal triage from happening and what should be the ventilation strategy whether our ventilation strategy has any role to minimize the intraoperative blood loss theoretically we would opt for a minimal peep and low venous uh, low tidal uh, volume so that a venous return is maintained uh, and intraoperative blood loss is less but the recent study uh, has shown that the effect that is uh, it was published in Uh, 2016 that effects of intraoperative lung protective ventilation with the positive end expiratory pressure on blood loss during hepatic resection surgery they have applied a 6 to 8 peep with the no peep and found that there is no alternative there is no difference in the surgical field or perioperative blood requirement and blood loss so uh, we need more studies in this aspect but theoretically uh, me applying minimal peep and low tidal volume Uh, seems to be a very attractive option and there is uh, now growing uh, focus on the use of hemostatic strategies like uh, uh, use of desmopressin which is a synthetic analog of uh, naturally occurring anti diuretic hormone vasopressin and uh, we have seen that it uh, dr vijesh has said that it is uh, transiently increase the factor 8 and one will be fracture so it is can be used in the anemic pa- I mean, uh, hemophilic patients on the one will be patients in the perioperative settings but now the use is extended to in trauma patients on anti platelets uh, or in any emergency scenarios but there is low to moderate evidence for routine use intraoperative use and but uh, uh, now it is uh, uh, use is limited to acute platelet dysfunction due to drugs or uremic patients it can the dose is subcutaneously or intravenously 0.3 microgram per kilogram body weight and uh, now the, uh, the there is increased uh, emphasis on the use of prothrombin complex concentrate there is uh, uh, it contains uh, um, three or four vitamin k dependent factors Uh, we use it uh, there is growing emphasis on the use of uh, prothrombin complex concentrate because there is uh, concerns about the uh, use of fresh frozen plasma 
uh, the previous speakers have narrated the uh, dangers in using the first person plasma in large quantities so that you know, to avoid the uh, large dose prothrombin um, um, fresh frozen plasma use now focus is on the use of prothrombin complex concentrate uh, this is uh, especially useful uh, for the patients coming you know, for in warfarin therapy for emergency surgery and the other concentrate which is used is uh, fibrinogen concentrates which is can be uh, the fiber low levels of fibrinogen is shown to predict uh, potential hemorrhage in the intraoperative settings so it is very important to correct the fibrinogen levels and uh, so, but it is not recommended in the european gu guidelines but uh, the cryoprecipitate they use cryoprecipitate instead but when you use the cryoprecipitate in large quantities you have to be aware of the potential problems like uh, hyperfibrinogenemia and but studies have shown that when you use cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen there is a reduced red cell and plasma transfusion requirement in the intraoperative settings but again you have to be aware of the increased chance of thrombotic events viscoelastic assays as i said uh, tag and rotum is increasingly being used in the major uh, settings nice guidelines recommended the routine use in cardiac and liver surgeries but the uh, british society of hematology has extended use its use in the trauma and obstetric hemorrhage uh, as uh, the other students are said in the opening remark uh, previously uh, there was a confusion whether a single unit transfusion is justified when you uh, as far as possible not to use single unit transfusion that was the uh, teaching and understanding before but now there is a revisit on the concept and uh, uh, there is a shift from culture of two unit transfusion to single unit transfusion and uh, after every transfusion you have to clinically assess and uh, patient check the hemoglobin and order the next unit only if it is required uh, stable patients without active bleeding even if uh, uh, they are anemic there is no need to transfuse the patient unless the medical condition warrants so so that the concept the new concept of single unit transfusion definitely reduces the transfusion rates and the economics in the post operative settings it uh, uh, again we have a role it uh, you have to reduce the frequency and volume of blood for blood test because iatrogenic anemia is now increasingly rec uh, recognized if you order a lot of blood test the quantity of blood collected will be very high and uh, reduced the uh, use of post operative drains i have mentioned it before and the post uh, as in the intraoperative cell salvage you can extend the technique in the post operative period or so post operative cell salvage it is a proven role in orthopedic procedures and you have to be you have to uh, pay your attention to the nutrition of the patient iron and vitamin supplementation in the post operative period and go for the restrictive blood transfusion strategies and uh, avoid secondary hemorrhage due to uh, infection or sloughing of the wound and uh, palming devices has to be continued in the post operative period that's very important you have to be aware of the ambient temperature and active warming measures in the post operative period most of the time we pay attention in the intraoperative settings only and uh, you have to give profile access for the upper di bleeding because stress ulcers can happen in the post operative period also avoiding drugs which can worsen anemia and the drug interactions uh, of the uh, each drug antibiotics or analgesics used in the post operative period anesthetists should be aware of it and avoid and treat infections properly so, uh, and promptly so we have anesthesiologist as a got a role in the post operative settings also and uh, this is uh, an article uh, recently come uh, this uh, published in 2018 international consensus statement on the management of post operative anemia after major surgical procedures so there is a lot of recommendations but the major recommendations is that after major surgery that is when the blood loss is more than 500 and the procedure is lasting for more than 2 hours with the pre operative anemia screen the patient for post operative anemia also so if the patient is anemic consider the option of early intravenous iron in case the patient is found to be anemic and severe anemia with the blended erythropoiesis think of the additional treatment option like erythropoietic stimulating agents if not contraindicated and very importantly 
restrictive transfusion threshold depending on comorbidities in a clinically stable patient. You have to think and uh, not twice but thrice before giving ordering for a blood transfusion. So to conclude, identify and management of high risk patients in the preoperative settings, early identification and is very important. Optimize the red cell mass with the oral iron or intravenous iron therapy or some other measures like uh, uh, if allowable erythrocyte uh, stimulating, uh, poison stimulating agents and meticulous surgical technique, cell salvage technique, tranexamic use of tranexamic acid is now well established and uh, uh, the use of regional anesthesia in conjunction with general anesthesia, avoidance of hypothermia, acidosis, hemodilution and correction of electrolyte imbalance, early identification of coagulopathy and uh, Hemostatic therapies like uh, judicious use of desmopressin and other procoagulant factors. One of the uh, two procoagulant factors we have emphasized is prothrombin complex uh, concentrate and uh, uh, fibrinogen. And close collaboration between anesthesiologist, surgeon, and hematologist. After all, it's a uh, teamwork, and uh, uh, you have to be in the team, active member of the team. Thank you for the patient listening. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for that wonderful presentation on uh, patient blood management, very concisely and uh, effectively narrated the whole point of patient blood management. Uh, the, the central point of patient blood management is we have to individualize and uh, provide or deliver a tailored uh, patient care. And as Sir has discussed, it has got three parts, three pillars, preoperative, erythrocyte, uh, red cell mass optimization and intraoperative patient assessment as well as uh, alternative to blood transfusion and postoperative minimizing the blood loss in the ICUs and identifying the uh, cause of bleeding and treating the postoperative anemia. Uh, as time is running short, I'm uh, handing it out to Dr. Amrish, sir. You may proceed, sir. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now, as it is well stressed here by Dr. Rajesh and uh, Dr. Ganesh Mohan, Patient uh, blood management is very, very important. It has been said that it is not a science fiction or a not a rocket science. This is an urgent need in every hospital. The idea behind patient man blood management is you can minimize the allergenic blood transfusions because we know or aware by now the hazards of the blood transfusion. As they said, there are three goals, like optimize the hemoglobin level and minimize the blood loss, as well as improve the physiological tolerance of the anemia. So there is a lot of changes that is going, are, uh, going on the, as it is evolving. So we have now the future directions in the blood management. In the future directions in blood management, we have here with us Dr. Kishore, who is not only MD, he has a uh, fellow of the Royal College of Anesthesiologists. He's a senior consultant and head of the department, Aster Mims Calicut. And he's a lead consultant in liver transplantation, GI surgeries, pediatric surgeries, and he's a DNB coordinator. So we will very well uh, listen from Dr. Kishore with regard to the future directions in uh, blood management. Dr. Kishore, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Antarish. Uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, uh, the other. Can you, am I audible? Yeah, fine. Uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, Radhesh and Sir Sanish and others behind this uh, academic session to ask me to uh, present this topic. Um, Uh, um, I must um, admit that uh, whatever I'm going to tell is most likely to be some repetitions will be happening. What uh, uh, Rajesh and uh, Vijesh has already uh, sort of uh, conveyed, and I, I'll, uh, what what I think the future direction is to uh, 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 incorporate these uh, suggestions into the into our practice. That is probably the best way, uh, the way forward in taking but in, in regarding but transfusions um, 
as we all know the transfusion medicine is uh, is a, a rapidly expanding field and changing rapidly even though we use blood and products um very often and very commonly we must understand that uh, these are uh, very scarce and costly resources and all the evidence have pointed out that uh, the use of blood and its products has very serious implications so naturally the interest and the focus is is in conserving and not giving much of blood use of hemostatic agents during the perioperative period and most of the focus is on how to reduce the use of uh, blood as well as the blood products so the key uh, key focus as rajesh uh, emphasized and which is also mentioned this patient but moment amrish sir also has uh, uh, spoken about that uh, in detail uh, this is a multidisciplinary evidence based approach to blood pro- blood and products utilization and what rajesh has said clearly it depends on optimizing the erythromycin deposit or the correcting the prior anemia you you set some restrictive transfusion threshold and you employ some methods to minimize blood loss during the perioperative period that's the key, key aspect in this space hello? in blood drainage yeah hello you continue uh and uh, various factors will help various strategies will help us in achieving this uh, this target like the using of uh, uh tranexamic acid and use of blood salvage if you find the blood loss is much more than 500 ml post of vigilance looking at all uh, hemoglobin and transfusing blood based on that how despite many constraints the patient ba- blood management has demonstrated good success and uh, overall it has shown a reduction in morbidity and uh, uh, and around 50% reduction in red cell transfusion this is the box uh, i mean what rajesh basically what rajesh has said clearly and just put it in the box and uh, it just uh, elaborate what just concisely what rajesh has said the point of this thing control salvage is more than fine or ml give tranexamic acid etc and what i i think we should all uh, incorporate these strategies to our daily routine and daily practice so that we can minimize the uh transfusions and can issues with the transfusion and use of products um tranexamic acid is one thing which has uh, come up quite uh, uh, commonly or quite frequently used now it is a synthetic derivative of uh, amino acid lysine and what it does it inhibits the plasmodium act- you know the activation and uh, basically stabilizes the clot and prevents fibrinolysis to certain extent the one trial which actually made this drug very popular was the crash through trial which was uh, in the trauma and uh, and uh, this trial has demonstrated that uh, use of uh, tranexamic acid has reduced mortality in traumatic bleeding and naturally we have extended this uh, uh, the findings of the trial into other areas of surgical bleeding like uh, pph cardiac surgeries major liver surgeries etc etc and all of the, the the available trials have shown that uh, the use of uh, tranexamic acid has indeed uh, resulted in reduced bleeding and reduced use of uh, uh, blood products and blood uh, one of the trials which actually uh, came uh, results came out in 2017 is the woman trial which actually uh, trial the uh, tranexamic acid in, in, in pph It was done in, in different geographical locations. And what I just uh, come up with the results is that there's a 19% reduction in mortality in patients with PPH if you use uh, tranexamic acid. And there's a time interval reduction also. Like if you give it within three hours of PPH, they have demonstrated that around 30% reduction in mortality in postpartum hemorrhage in, in, in women. So this naturally established the place of uh, uh, tranexamic acid in in situations of massive bleeding and al- also it 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 will prevent bleeding in um, if you give early enough that is prophylactically it can reduce the amount of bleeding in major surgeries the other area which is looking at is the crash three trial is looking at whether tranexamic can could be helpful in traumatic brain injuries now the dosage recommended is a standard dose of 1 gram iv in adults 
and uh, if further required, you could use an infusion of 500 milligram per hour. The question question of uh, whether using this agent will increase whether it will increase the thrombotic risk or not has been always been there, but class two trial that didn't demonstrate any evidence of increased thrombotic risk. In fact, uh, it, uh, it showed a uh, reduction in the incidence of myocardial infarction in these patients. So, as of now, there is the, the evidence is not much towards the thrombotic risk, but uh, probably we may require more elaborate studies to finally uh, confirm it. There was a risk of seizure when, there is a risk of seizure when, when you give large dose in excess of two grams. So, so the optimal dose, which uh, universal dose recommended is one gram IV. Other area which, again, will help us in uh, achieving our targets, the use of point of per test. We, we generally have been uh, guiding our transfusion therapies and uh, product therapy based on conventional coagulation. Just the problem with conventional coagulation tests are that uh, slow turnaround times which obviously results in inappropriate transfusions. And you know that uh, the INR is actually a poor predictor of bleeding. Actually, it was, INR was basically to check the adequacy of warfare in medication, but it, it doesn't uh, give us a predictor of bleeding, especially in chronic low disease patients and all, INR is a poor predictor of bleeding. And uh, people have uh, addressed this issue and checked whether the usefulness of standard by coagulum test is there any evidence and uh, there is no sound evidence to guide hemostatic therapy based on standard plasma coagulum test and they also said it could not diagnose coagulopathy. So there comes the viscoelastic uh, point of test which Rajesh and uh, Vijish mentioned. Two tests are commonly used or, or, or the tests available now the thromboelastography or the TEG or which is from the US and the thromboelastometry or the Rotom, which is from German-based companies. Now, what these tests actually does is they they give us a global picture of a global clot floating in the whole blood, and they give us a graphic display of clot development and clot stability as well. And this is has been extremely extensively used in the settings of uh, liver transplants, cardiac surgery, trauma, and etc. Uh, what what these, these uh, tests use is they evaluate the kinetics of the entire clotting process, right from clot formation to fibrin polymerization and the clot strength. Uh, it reflects the interaction of plasma, blood cells, and platelets, and it gives the information about fibrolysis. And if you use different activators, activators, and it can increase the diagnostic capability. The example is if you use the fiptum reagent in the rotum setting, it can guide, guide us on fibrinogen therapy. This is the picture of the, 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 the result of the picture of the Rotom or the tech, which is both gives essentially the same picture. They have different uh, nomenclature for their uh, factors, like for the tech, uh, it is R time and K time, whereas uh, for the Rotom, it is the clotting time and clot formation time. And for the tech, for the strength of the clot, the tech says a maximum amplitude, whereas the Rotom says MCF or the maximum clot firmness like that. So as you can see from the picture, it gives uh, uh, the, the the clotting time, the kinetics, the strength of the clot, as well as it informs of the, whether there is a clot, excessive clot lysis happening. The, this is just a pictorial description of a uh, of, of few uh, situations. The, the top one, the A panel is, is a normal uh, rotum when you use an extum agent and this is the normal rotum graph when you use a fiptum agent. And the second term is basically due to lack of uh, fibrinogen. You get a low, low, ample, low, uh, it's not clear if picture, but just gives a low fiptum. So you need to give uh, fibrinogen. And the picture C again shows low clot firmness with the MCF of around uh, 52, whereas the fiptum is normal. So it requires plate plate. And the picture D shows the global reduction in all clotting factors, platelets and uh, fibrinogen. So like with the UK, you could make diagnostic and you targeted uh, products. And this is a picture of showing um, uh, the fibrolysis 
you can see the right tail appearance is that right, the clot is extensionalized so that you get a right tail appearance in in all these so you need to give anti fibromatic try to in a try to stop the fibromatic uh this is the rotom uh, picture of the rotom machine we have in our uh, unit and uh, you get a the graphs in the uh, the computer screen it's a very you it's a four channel thing you can use four re, four at the same time and say the you can you can get the results in 10 minutes to 30 minutes time uh, if you look at the various studies which which look at the efficacy of uh, point of okay test and cardiac mostly in cardiac surgery patients and uh, uh, it has come out with this, uh, the reduced allogenic transfusions and which has overall improved the outcome and they compared the uh, whether uh, standard lab at the test or the rotum for the prediction of post op brain liver transplant and uh, concluded that rotum assays were better predictors of bleeding and and also they could uh, identify the fibromal related bleeding again um with the few looks at a few tests like the gold directed and uh, using thromboelectrometry uh, along with administration of uh, the plasma constraint and both of this uh, has shown that there is reduced use of blood and blood products there are other point of care tests also which you can utilize at the theater side or the med side like the hemoq test for estimating the hemoglobin more or less uh, validated so you can depend on them rather than waiting for the lab test to come about acp you all know we use in uh, cardiac surgeries and vascular surgeries to to assess the adequacy of hepatization and the reversal um there is a new monitor where you get a continuous monitoring of uh, hemoglobin which is we use this spectrophotometric uh, methodology like a pulse ox simulator probe you can put and this is the maximum monitor we we use a com- continuous uh, display of the hemoglobin values and uh, if not the actual really can at least uh, you know the trend of what's happening you can also have platelet assay again a point of interest for you you can use the platelet function and effect uh, as well this is the picture of the um, uh, the continuous uh, sp monitor and you, it's just like you putting a finger probe is a new new device come to the market in 3 4 years back about um, a complex concentrates which is uh, been used um, or being recommended more and more the protomin complex concentrates can is a highly purified uh, complex uh, complement derived from human plasma or obviously treated and virally inactivated so you don't get the infection transmission it contains the factors 2 7 9 and 10 it also contains some anticoagulant protein s s and some amount of acarnation so that it, it might slightly balance the thrombotic risk when you use these products what is the advantage of uh, these products are that you you get a high concentration of clotting factors in, in a low volume you usually reconstitute in 50 ml of blood actually this pro- this product was only licensed for reversal of warfarin mm-hmm. infection in the uk and the dose recommended is around 25 to 30 international units kg it's not actually uh, recommended for uh, use in bleeding patients or uh, other areas but off label use has been uh, it has been off label use is continuing and it's been used extensively um we we have only limited data on using in bleeding patients but and the guidelines are also not very robust whether we should use in bleeding patient but it has found a place in the emergency departments and the operative room especially in cardiac surgery and uh, probably transplant surgery liver transplant surgery and also in um, obstetric hemorrhages and it has almost replaced ff in many european centers basically trying to mitigate the effects of uh, the complications with ff transfusion and more over the volume overload if you, if you want to give large amounts of uh, plasma the volume overload which is also is uh, addressed by giving this fiber uh, the the plasma uh, pcc or the plasma uh, protomin complex concentrate as well as fiber overload and it has become sort of first line hemostatic therapy in trauma situations 
again fibrinogen concentrates it contains 1 gram of fibrinogen in 50 ml it again it is only licensed for use in preventing bleeding in congenital hypofibrinemia cases but of label use has been it has been used in widely used in bleeding and it is continue to be used the problem in hemastic bleeding is early reduction of uh, fibrinogen and the cortical factor so early giving fibrinogen based on rotum or tag uh, monitoring has been found to be very useful and use of these uh, com- complex concentrates have led to significant reduction in rbc use and it has overall reduced the cost and lowered mortality rates and there is an increasing body of evidence showing the efficacy and safety of these products so more and more probably uh, we could uh, there is an evidence for introducing to our practice the only thing is maybe quite expensive and it has recently come to india i think um, uh, the potamin complex that's what i mean i don't know about fibrinogen concentrate whether it's available but they are increasingly marketing this uh, pcc nowadays um if you key the some of the algorithms which has incorporated the, the rotum as well as uh, the concentrates in the uh, the the algorithm for managing postpartum hemorrhage um again uh, in um, trauma uh, uh situations the algorithms based on the fibtum uh, the rotum test mind you you have to look at the the top thing you have to uh, adjust the temperature and exercise and other things as rajesh mentioned earlier but these algorithms are, are increasingly used using rotum as well as a uh, product um uh, sorry again uh, some of the tests which looked at the first line therapy with coagulation factors concentrates combined with point of coagulation in cardiovascular surgery and they, they have said that it's reduced allogenic blood pressure considerably and there was not any uh, thrombotic complications uh, one thing about recombinant factors so we just 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 come up with a very uh, huge enthusiasm to be used in bleeding patients but uh, uh, in this session as going there now it's basically a glycoprotein structure which is similar to factor 7a uh, it does uh, um uh, using the dna biotechnology is made and it was licensed for to be used in prevention of bleeding in hemophilia patients undergoing procedures or or stopping bleeding in uh, patients with hemophilia again in the initial phase there was off label use in massive bleeding in surgical cases and in trauma uh though it is a potent trauma center one of the problems with the, uh, this uh, recombinant factor 7a is that uh, you need to have adequate amount of other co- coagulation factors in the body to have its effect like you need to have at least fibrinogen more than 1 gram per liter and platelets over 20000 so if you want to give it in, in massive bleeding situations you, you need to give it uh, uh pretty early there is a potential risk of uh, thrombotic complications So, uh, the initial indicator for me is not it's not that widely used i think nowadays few things about duplo depletion which which is already mentioned it helps in reducing all these infections and transition reactions etc the radiated blood prevents the transition associated graft versus host and it could be used in immune compromised patients again that that then reducing technology again which is mentioned earlier you inactivate patterns for bacteria and virus in the plasma using either mesenchymal blue or solvent detergent treatments in platelets uh, you use ultraviolet rays and riboflavin etc and this is found to inactivate almost all the pathogens like uh, the hiv hcv hbv and even the protozoa and what is more worried about the prion disease so this uh, the treated products are in routine use in um, europe don't know what the status of them in, in our country but they are routine use in europe not that much used in the us and the uk let's substitute few words about there is already always been a look for uh, available good uh, 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 
a good blood substitute. Uh, those are the hemoglobin-based toxin carriers and perfluorocarbons. And they are made from, uh, the hemoglobin-based carriers are made from human or bovine uh, RBCs and cell-free hemoglobin are purified through filtration chromatography. Uh, there are quite a few types of uh, hemoglobin carriers available, like the traumatic cross-link HP, polymerized HP, etc. Even though there was an intense research and intense uh, trial going on, the, there is none has got therapeutic license to use as of yet now because both in animal trials as well as in human trials, there was significant morbidity and mortality during and uh, including stroke, hypertension, cardiac lesions, and even death. So, as of now, there is no therapeutic license for using these uh, hemoglobin carriers. So, just to sum up, the, the, the forward the way going forward in blood transfusion is uh, uh, really to minimize blood and blood products use. You need to keep uh, uh, low targets for transfusing fat cells. And probably you should, we should incorporate algorithms based on point of get testing, especially the rotum or the peg for, for use of products in uh, major bleeding situations rather than going for conventional test. Factor transfusion rates also will help us in addressing the issues with the, uh, the uh, transfusion related problems. Blood substitutes are still miles away from us. So, yes, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Kishore. Such a vast topic you have presented uh, and uh, you have made it simple and your excellent presentation. As you have stressed, that uh, allergenic uh, blood transfusions should be minimized as far as possible and uh, patient blood management sy system should be there in every hospital by which it is possible to avoid the hazards of allergenic blood transfusions. So since the time is running out, we'll keep the questions toward the end. And so far as anesthesiologists, we presented and uh, covered this topic. And today we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Ganesh Mohan. The, as we see, the transfusion medicine has evolved and so much to so that it has become a specialty on its own. And here we have the HOD of transfusion medicine, Dr. Ganesh Mohan. So it is really a great um, privilege for all of us to hear from Dr. Ganesh Mohan. He'll be speaking on the transition medicine impact as well as the prospect. Dr. Ganesh Mohan, as you already introduced by Dr. Radhakrishnan, that he is heading the transition medicine in uh, Manipal. He is the chief coordinator of a Comprehensive Center for Benign Hematological Disorders, Kasuba Medical Hospital, uh, Manipal. And he is the quality manager there in the blood center. His areas of interest, hemostasis, coagulation, then thrombotic uh, microangiopathies and patient blood management. It is very important to hear from him about that. He is a member of various national and international organizations and he uh, has a lot of articles in the international journals, a lot of publications. So Dr. Ganesh Mohan, welcome and uh, we are uh, eager to hear from you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, thank you, uh, IC, also for inviting me uh, along with uh, all the anesthesiologists sitting here. So I'll be the old one out here. Uh, without taking much time, I'll be uh, going through whatever we have seen uh, over the last three topics. Dr. Vijish, Dr. Rajesh, as well as Dr. Kiran, as uh, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Kishore has already gone through different aspects of uh, patient blood management. Uh, so, as example, perioperative uh, hemostasis, intraoperative or uh, intraoperative blood uh, salvage techniques, alternatives to transfusion, blood transfusion, and uh, usage of uh, pharmacological agents. So, uh, what I will be going through is uh, whatever we are practicing here and a few practical aspects of implementing or the scenarios where we face patient blood management. Uh, Coming to the transfusion medicine as such, previously, uh, as Dr. Uh, uh, Balashan sir told, previously it was blood banking and uh, 
there was only whole blood usage and within last uh, the first transfusion medicine uh, pg was introduced in sgpga in 1990 and now currently almost 80 pgs uh, post graduates are coming out every year and compared to the old uh, concept blood banking or the whole blood usage evolution of uh, blood transfusion into components different components modifications now coming into the newer concept called patient blood management or individualized patient tailored therapy by multi uh, disciplinary team so there is an evolution going on uh, so what are the changes we have seen and what is the prospect which uh, transfusion medicine can uh, go to the future and anesthesiologist uh, anesthesia as a team always uh, be in touch with us because lot of the time uh, we receive order from order for transfusion transfusion of blood components from anesthesia whether it is Uh, preoperative or perioperative or postoperative especially in the critical cares and icus so there is a one second so there is a uh, two side to transfusion medicine one is lab side which compromises almost 30 to 40 percentage of our workload where we have the manufacturing units and good manufacturing practices to produce blood products as safe as possible and there is another side which is a clinical side where we take part Uh, in the diagnosis and therapeutic interventions regenerative medicine uh, with products like platelet uh, rich plasma platelet fibrinogen glue uh, mesenchymal stem cell therapy and transplantation in both stem cell as well as uh, solid organ transplantation i will be concentrating only on the two aspect which we have discussed here one is patient blood management uh, how we can individualize Uh, patient care because uh, not all the patient are same their needs are different their physiology is different so how can we tailor uh, make it for individualized uh, patient and how can we utilize point of care test like either tech or rotum in implementing patient blood management in the intraoperative as well as postoperative phase so this is a definition of patient blood management which is nothing but a uh, proactive approach in which clinicians try to reduce or avoid unnecessary transfusions by using evidence based pharmacological medical and surgical modalities to manage anemia optimize hemostasis and minimize blood loss in a patient specific manner and the primary aim is to improve the patient safety so ultimate aim is to improve the patient safety and the clinical outcome by appropriately managing the patients on blood there are three pillars which we have seen one is first pillar is peri uh, preoperative phase which is the optimizing the red cell mass and reducing or identifying the patient at risk of bleeding by their coagulation screening either by ASTH batch score or by doing coagulation screening test so if there is anemia diagnosed uh, in the preoperative phase we have to correct it especially if it is nutritional anemia we have to switch over to iron supplements and Uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents rather than um, going for uh, red cell transfusion because transfusion as such blood as such is a val valuable inventory which has no alternative as dr kisho said so we have to on the one hand we have to save that precious inventory and on the second hand other hand we have to avoid the risk uh, the patient might have if it is an unnecessary transfusion so correction of preoperative anemia as uh, dr rajesh told there were so many studies uh, so much uh, randomized control trials published over the years and the latest one was prevent trial uh, which showed that uh, they had they did not they, they did not find any much improvement but however in their methodology they have also mentioned that there is only 20% of the patient in that study group uh, got corrected of their anemia prior to the surgery so the remaining 80% was still anemic at the uh, surgery time so that was also a fact confounding factor in their uh, finding and going to second pillar the perioperative phase the main aim will be the minimizing blood loss and bleeding uh, switching over to the alternatives of transfusion intraoperative cell salvage anh autologous transfusion all those things comes under the second pillar and third pillar will be in the postoperative phase where we have to avoid iatrogenic blood loss anemia and identifying the postoperative anemia and treating it as well as uh, early diagnosis of uh, critical uh, coagulopathy in the critically ill patients especially dic sepsis sepsis induced coagulopathy and sepsis induced thrombocytopenia 
so uh, pre operative phase anemia transfusion already covered these are the um, guidelines or the steps which we can implement to screen patients for uh, uh or to identify patients uh, having iron deficiency anemia and what we can do so the pre anesthetic clinic is always the hub of or to start patient blood management and this is another tool uh, to screen patient for uh, coagulation abnormalities or the chances of bleeding whether the patient is taking oral anticoagulants whether the patient had any bleeding episode and if the positive history is there what we can do other steps which we can in, uh, improve or implement in our center to uh, improve the blood utilization or to avoid unnecessary transfusions is one is a maximum surgical blood ordering schedule which is a quantitative measurement having three tools one is cross match transfusion ratio the other one is transfusion probability and the other one is transfusion index so it depends upon the blood inventory and most importantly the type of surgery the surgeon or the team of surgeons which is involved for example so team a will be different from team b and anesthesia technique which used in the surgery and after all considering all these things it is ideal to keep a ct ratio of less than 2 and we are currently following type and screen type and screen means we will blood group and rh type the patient and only the screening part will be done we will not cross match the unit so we will do type and screen for all the procedures where transfusion index is less than 0.5 and transfusion probability is less than 30 percentage and we do cross match only if the transfusion index is more than 0.5 and transfusion probability is more than 30 percentage so we have identified the unit wise surgery where the values match with this and we have given a list Uh, so and so surgery is required cross match and so and so surgery is required only type and screen thereby we can efficiently manage the inventory <laughs> coming to the intraoperative part uh, what if the patient develops bleeding the alternatives i am not going to discuss i am i will be only discussing about uh, implementing or ma- maintaining a transfusion protocol uh, dealing with the massive transfusion the initial concept of uh, clinician oriented uh, ordering of blood then later changed to formula based transfusion protocol massive transfusion protocol as we commonly know it one is to one is to one ratio uh, balanced resuscitation everything comes under that and which is now going in favor of goal based massive transfusion which again identifies patient and individualized care instead of following one size fits for all we manage patient according to their individual need and viscoelastic testing plays a very crucial role in uh, managing these patients uh, bleeding patients in delivering goal based massive transfusion uh, whenever we have a bleeding patient it can be due to trauma postpartum hemorrhage on table surgical bleeds by uh, um, aortic rupture aneurysm or cardiac surgery patients so when our patient bleeds we have to send for uh, basic investigations correct temperature as hypothermia as doctor rajesh said hypocalcemia we have to identify calcium electrolyte imbalance and ph then then we can start tranexamic acid as most of the studies crash 2 crash 3 women trial uh, most of the studies show tranexamic acid reduces the blood um, product utilization as well as improves the patient survival and uh, crash 3 which always which had addressed that if used within 3 hours of trauma the tranexamic acid improves the patient survival but after 3 hours there is not much evidence and we can switch over to gold directed viscoelastic testing guided transfusion and uh, we can decide what the patient need at that time so going through a case a uh, 43 year old male with history of alleged rta came with uh, blunt trauma abdomen fast was positive was in hypovolemic shock uh, on day 2 the ct contrast showed liver laceration grade 4 exploratory laparotomy was performed on day 3 and these were the investigation details uh, at the time of admission patient had severe anemia uh, platelet count thrombocytopenia coagulopathy and uh, acidosis so massive transfusion protocol was activated and which was sent for take and as we can see day one night the take showed severe primary fibrinolysis because of the liver injury and uh, we have advised tranexamic acid and con- uh, continued transfusion support because patient was hemodynamically unstable and consecutively the patient's uh, need for transfusion was not reducing so we have mon- we monitored using the take where day 2 day 3 day 4 day 6 Uh, the patient was taken for surgery on day 4 uh, so we can see the fibrinolysis was still going on so we have advised uh, put the patient on trans- tranexamic acid infusion rather than uh, bolus dose because the ongoing fibrinolysis will end up in consuming all the coagulation factors and the factors which we provide through blood transfusion so we have advised tran- uh, tranexamic acid infusion and once the fibrinolysis 
improved or slowly started improving, we have stopped the tranexa infusion and continued the transfusion support till the patient was taken up for surgery. And post-op, the fibrinolysis part was uh, cured because of the liver injury was packed and the uh, patient was hemodynamically stable. So this is the lab uh, parameters, uh, hemoglobin, these are two hemoglobin and hematocrit. This is the uh, fibrinogen part, the purple line is fibrinogen part, and this is the platelet part, which during the bleeding time, it was uh, very much low, uh, platelet as well as fibrinogen, and in total, the patient received 17 red cell concentrate, 26 uh, plasma products, 30 random donor platelets, and 60 cryoprecipitate, because this has the most uh, concentrated fibrinogen part among the blood products. So we have advised him uh, 60 cryoprecipitate over the three days of uh, course. So what is goal-based massive transfusion algorithm? Uh, this is our example which we follow here. And at the start of hemorrhage or when the patient is coming with hemodynamically uh, hemorrhagic shock, we send samples for CBC, ABG, TEC or Rotom and uh, call to activate goal-based massive transfusion protocol. Uh, by the time, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable and is, who is a non-responder to crystal oils, we switch over to two units of ORs negative for ABO specific TRBCs to find the time. And by the time the investigations are ready, we uh, utilize the algorithm to provide what the patient needs, which uh, as Dr. Kishore said, there are so many algorithms available. This is what we follow here. And what comparing fixed ratio to goal-based uh, individualized care, fixed ratio is uniform treatment for every individual, whereas this is individualized component therapy. Uh, fixed ratio can lead to over or under utilization of blood product transfusion based on platelet poor plasma test result because standard coagulation tests are always done in platelet poor plasma. The PT, the APTD, the fibrinogen concentrate is done in platelet poor plasma. So we don't know the role played by platelet as well as red cells in the clot formation. And it assesses only a part of the coagulation pathway and it is ease of use because once it is activated, it will go on in transfusion packs. So two units or four units uh, as per the hospital transfusion committee guidelines. It will go in packs, so it is very easy to use, but these are the disadvantage, whereas goal-based, uh, as we can see, a whole-blood-based uh, whole viscoelastic testing, which uh, includes all the cellular component into the coagulation, and the tests are done in patient temperature, so we can identify the in vivo coagulation status of the patient. So this is our data comparing uh, formula-based versus goal-based, as uh, the green one shows goal-based and the blue one shows uh, formula based. Now, uh, there is this is for uh, red cells, this is for FFP, this is for platelets, and this is for cryo. Among 222 patients, 113 patients managed with formula based and 109 managed with goal based massive transfusion. And in total, we had 16.4 percentage reduction in blood product transfusion, that is 1867 versus 1560. And each component was having a reduced uh, reduction in the usage, but 31.8% uh, of the patient in formula-based had coagulopathy at the end of massive transfusion, whereas only 6.9% uh, percentage of the patient had coagulopathy in goal-based. So at a reduced product usage, we attained hemostasis better with use of goal-based massive transfusion. And coming to the post-operative phase, especially in the ICUs, we can uh, utilize methods to implement to reduce the iatrogenic blood loss, we have to limit the uh, investigation that is being sent. We can, uh, we can use microtubes to send the investigations and implement restricted uh, strategies as discussed or audited uh, based on our hospital needs. So we can decide hemoglobin, platelet uh, triggers, but FFP, uh, we don't usually follow triggers. FFP transmission, we always follow uh, clinical uh, status of the patient, especially bleeding or non-bleeding. In platelets, red cells, and cryoprecipitate for fibrinogen, we can follow the triggers. Platelet threshold, the latest which we follow is BSH guidelines 2016, which they have uh, again subdivided into uh, lumbar puncture procedures, epidural procedures, uh, percutaneous liver biopsy, neuraxial procedures. So each procedure has uh, different cutoff. And in the ICUs, it is imperative to identify the coagulopathy in critically ill patients, which are because they are not like a normal uh, or, or what we can say, uh, post-operative patient in the ICU is not like a normal patient in the medicine or pre-operative mm -hmm. ward because they are already in a prothrombotic stage one and their D-dimers are elevated too. So there is a different in tools to approach or diagnose all these patients. And it is... Uh, very common to find or observe DIC, sepsis, and sepsis-induced coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia in these patients. 
uh, going into the case, a uh, 56-year-old female uh, presented with fever for seven days and inability to walk for four days, uh, diagnosed to have AADP. So uh, therapeutic plasma exchange was, proceed, uh, was initiated. Four cycles of 1.3 plasma volume was processed with 5% albumin. And on day three, she was diagnosed to have sepsis. And on day four, the patient developed acute kidney injury and acidosis. So these are the uh, lab parameters of the patient. On day one, the hemoglobin was gradually falling down. The platelet, again, gradually falling down. On the creat and the blood urea uh, on the higher side because patient developing a kidney injury. Uh, the PT and APTT started going up or deranged from day three onwards. Uh, it went on. So to correct the PT, APTT values, uh, four FFAs were transfused on day four, which uh, didn't get corrected. The PT or APTT. again, four FFAs were transfused on day five. And on day six, a TEG was sent uh, to assess after the consultation. We advised one TEG for the patient because we suspected it might be sepsis induced coagulopathy. So, this was the picture. As uh, from the picture, it is clear the patient is clearly having a prothrombotic stage in the initiation phase, in the amplification phase, and the propagation phase. This is a compensatory fibrinolysis, which is different from the fibrinolysis which we have seen earlier in the trauma case. So the hypercoagulable picture in the patient combined with the prolonged PT APTT doesn't go hand in hand. So what is happening is in vivo, the patient is having a hypercoagulable picture uh, or uh, patient is forming more clots than required, leading into a multi-organ dysfunction syndrome or the end organ damage. Whereas the PT, which is assessed in platelet poor plasma, and the already consumed uh, or activated factors in the plasma may not lead to a specified time period clotting time. So that is why we are having a, that PT prolongation and a hypercoagulable picture in the patient. So we have decided to start the patient on heparin and on day six, uh, on day six, we started the patient on heparin and this was the repeat tech on day eight where the patient's coagulopathy has resolved and patient did not develop, go on to develop uh, any other organ damage or injury and the patient was discharged uh, a few days later. So these were the parameters. Again, if you can see the PT, APTT values on day 5, 27, 60, while at, uh, even after 4 FFP transfusion. And on day 6, uh, after take, uh, given the heparin, the PT, APTT values gradually started to come down uh, till day 9. So these are the guidelines which we, uh, we have already existing in the literature for diagnosing and managing sepsis and uh, differentiating BAC from sepsis-induced coagulopathy, as well as managing uh, sepsis-induced coagulopathy with uh, antithrombin agent. The, the critical question is, when do we give them heparin? Uh, the only tool which we have now we can do uh, is TEG or Rotom. If we, if we can observe a hypercoagulable picture, we can go ahead and start on heparin. Otherwise, uh, we have to do other uh, thrombin generation tests or uh, global hemostasis assays, which are not that common. And this is again on the pathophysiology of DACM skipping ah, this. Ah, oh. Oh, and the thrombocytopenia. Yeah. And the causes of thrombocytopenia in the intensive care unit are sepsis, most common, DIC, blood loss, thrombotic microangiopathy, heparin induced thrombocytopenia. We have to keep all these things when we find isolated thrombocytopenia in a patient admitted in the ICU and roll out one by one. Other steps that can be uh, in implemented, we can reduce the atronic blood loss, we can choose restrictive strategies, viscoelastic testing, CLD patients, the latest guideline says, viscoelastic tests are recommended over standard coagulation test in critical care uh, medicine guidelines. The patient-centric evidence-based decision-making by multidisciplinary uh, team as a part of patient blood management always help the patient. In summary, Pre anesthesia clinic in, is a hub of PBM, anemia correction, identifying uh, coagulation status of the patient and uh, implementing MSBOS. Intraoperative patient blood management, goal based massive transfusion, alternatives to transfusion, uh, cell salvages, uh, pharmacological therapies, and post operative, all these things which we have discussed. And coagulopathy in the critical care is also important to identify and differentiate. So, this is in general a chart or um, summary of the things which we have to improve the patient outcome by implementing patient uh, blood management. Uh, so in, in short, the total, uh, the speakers which, uh, who already spoke before me uh, gave in-depth uh, detail about patient blood management as Dr. Rajesh rightly said, which is a, it is a quite different thing to understand what, uh, what is patient blood management, what is, is it useful, is it not useful. 
so what we do is always implement or identify the gap areas as we are doing it now in two fairy two areas one is in critical care and one is in pre-anesthesia pre -anesthesia clinic uh, identify the gap areas uh, try to do a uh, um, analysis by implementing some changes and then find out regularly auditing it and then find out whether it is useful or not uh, that is the only way to go about it in a resource limited setting like us so concluding my talk uh, i'm really uh, thankful to all of you thank you well then uh, dr ganesh mohan actually with your presentation and the case presentations you have really uh, excellently presented how a presence of a transfusion medicine department and a specialist in that will definitely make a difference in the management of the patient instead of fixed uh, management it is always to have a goal directed therapy and those two cases what you presented really it made the difference with regard to the management i hope in the days to come this speciality will uh, come in every um, teaching hospitals as well as the hospital and thereby the patient management uh, system with the individualized management will be uh, established by which the hazards of allogenic transfusions which can be minimized and more and more good clinical outcome can be achieved so all the speakers have done excellent and uh, this topic as such is a very vast topic and a little bit of it's dry also but you with your presentations have made it uh, as the remarks are also coming you have made it excellent and um, made it simple also for every one of the uh, to know about that all anesthesiologists who as uh, perioperative physicians who are doing more and more blood transfusions in their management and this was very worthwhile for them as well as for the post graduates so since the time we have some few questions actually one question was for uh, vijesh venugopal with regard to actually whether uh, fibrinogen concentrate should be preferred over cryo precipitate whether you would like to take well uh, as per the uh, the trials that are there uh, there is not much difference shown because the trials are all small uh, are not are very poorly powered so there is not much difference seen but again i doubt the availability of fibrinogen concentrate i have not used it but cryoprecipitate definitely i have used and cryoprecipitate uh, the advantage of fibrinogen would be that uh, it is lyophilized and it, it doesn't have to be thawed it has to be just uh, prepared and again it is uh, a pasteurized product so it is uh, the viral inactivation also has taken place but i really don't know the difference in the outcomes whether there is any active difference in the outcome and dr ganesh mohan you want to add uh... Yes, sir. Fibrinogen concentrate is available in our country, which one vial costs around thirty to forty thousand. But again, uh, when we compare the patient status, uh, there is clinically, if we can see, uh, fiber correction of fibrinogen may be comparable or better studies we need. But in a resource poor setting, if the patient is affordable, we can go definitely go for fibrinogen concentrate. If the patient is not affordable, we might have to switch to cryoprecipitate. That is what I have to say to that. So thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Vijesh and uh, Dr. Ganesh Mohan. There is one more uh, question to Dr. Rajesh, and I think in the chat box I saw you answering that. When you do use Rotem in uh, obstetric and uh, trauma patients, Dr. Rajesh, please. Yeah, I think Dr. Kishore has answered uh, as early in the resuscitation phase. And uh, uh, previous uh, indications for uh, using the point of uh, viscoelastic test like uh, TEG and Rotum was uh, restricted to uh, uh, liver surgeries and cardiac surgeries. Now, but now the uh, 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 British Society of Hematology extends its uh, usefulness in the settings of trauma and obstetrics also. The point I have to mention uh, Along with that is that uh, in massive obstetric hemorrhage, the first component to come down is fibrinogen level. And it is very important to replace fibrinogen level, but we should not over transfuse fibrinogen because it can uh, uh, lead to uh, thrombotic events also. So uh, 
whether you have to use uh, cryoprecipitate at this juncture and uh, how much cryoprecipitate you use, uh, what specifically patient tailored component, what component you have to use, that is the usefulness of this uh, uh, viscoelastic test. So as Kishore has answered, we have to use it at, at the early in the resuscitation phase. And it was shown usefulness in the two cases of uh, uh, Dr. Ganesh Mohan has uh, presented also. So thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you, sir. And uh, I, apart from that, one topic probably would I like to hear from all the panelists that um, it has been said 10% uh, of the transfusions can be avoided with the autologous transfusion, which can be made use of in 50% of the surgeries. We, in our institution way back when we started, we were uh, doing this. But what I find is it is not that much utilized, though it has been said with all the hazards of allergenic transfusion, maybe because of uh, the testing, cross-matching and unused blood, how best to use it. These are the queries that still remain and we have not made use of that. I mean, autologous transfusion, acute normal volumic hemodilution, by which most of the hazards of allergenic uh, transmissions can be avoided. So I need a comment uh, from uh, Ganesh Mohan as well as others, if you, you have any uh, practice or uh, expertise in that. Thank you, sir. Uh, we do practice autologous uh, transfusion here, but only in very few selected uh, cases, especially uh, from uh, ortho uh, for total hip replacement or total knee replacement patients are coming and they fit for the criteria to donate. Sometimes we get a patient who are coming for autologous transfusion, but comparing to the other criteria, which is highlighted in the uh, guidelines, we don't get that much of patients. Uh, for autologous transfusion. One thing is they have to come uh, at least 72 hours prior to the surgery to the hospital. So that is a disadvantage for the patient and uh, they might not come at that day. Uh, so only very few cases which we have seen because uh, patient has to be willing for that one and second, they have to come 72 hours prior to the surgery and uh, plus they might not want to donate blood prior to the surgery also. So the education part on the patient side is also important. In general, we, I have not seen that much of cases coming for autologous donation. This uh, uh, acute normal volumic uh, hemodilution, particularly the single unit uh, blood transfusion, which is actually can be avoided. And uh, this we were practicing actually before. We used to collect and replace with the, some crystalloids and we used to manage and done, but uh, it is not practiced that much. Any comment on that? Acute normal volumic hemodilution. Collect the blood <clears> after <throat> induction from the patient and replace with crystalloids, and thereby the single unit blood transfusion can be avoided. Uh, yes, sir. As far as I, I can say, uh, on table, we can practice acute normal volumic hemodilution, especially if we expect the patient to bleed more, like. Uh, uh, whether there is a cardiac surgery or transplantation surgeries, if the patient can go for ANH, we can go. But generally, uh, ANH is not performed here also. In my center also, generally, ANH is not performed routinely. So that is, again, also one area which we can look into, one aspect which we can tap to uh, get more autologous transfusion going on. Any idea why, why that uh, this one we have not made use of you are a transfusion medicine department, probably you may be knowing why we have not explored that uh, this one, which is very, very useful in this. Uh, when you look at the real uh, hazards of the blood transfusion. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, primarily when the patient uh, on table, uh, generally what we practice is we correct the anemia. If, there is, if the patient is having a lower hemoglobin, we correct the hemoglobin by uh, allogenic transfusion. If the patient is having, say, hemoglobin 15, 16, uh, has a good red cell mass, definitely we can think about or plan about auto, uh, uh, KNH. But again, it requires uh, a multidisciplinary team. We have to be there and OT ready with uh, on table before giving or inducing the patient. Uh, we have to uh, start collecting the blood products uh, and then transfusing them. Uh, sorry, not transfusing and then giving crystalloids 
so it requires again a time consuming process at least 30 45 minutes is gone prior to the surgery uh, so and cost wise if we come where Uh, allogenic blood transfusion versus autologous it is always cost effective autologous transfusion is always cost effective but i think most of the time that uh, the time period which we need to spend for uh, collecting a one unit product from the patient on table i think that is the bottleneck where we have to switch, uh, think about or plan about in all centers which for example if we have enough resources to practice this that team they can think about it and implement it which which is completely safe also because the patient is not ill uh, i think uh, uh, one reason is that the availability is quite uh, uh, the availability of blood is not at all an issue now of our area so that may be one reason why we are deterring it we used to do it but um, not very often but we used to do it after induction we used to do after induction yeah yeah we were also doing uh, uh, putting central lines and then uh, then we used to take ourselves to get the blood back from the bank and uh, uh, that's why we use it but i think one of the reason as one one may be the availability then um then uh, uh, i think we should practice it that's so suggested uh, it should be in our practice especially in big cases because uh, the hazards of transfusion must more compared to the effort we put into take in so i think we should be practicing more often thank you and uh, one more uh, this one is that um, when the blood loss is between 15 to 30% the transfusions can be avoided until unless patient has a comorbidity or there is any uh, organ perfusion hampered or something like that it has been said that you can avoid the blood transfusion up to 30% from 15 to 30% whereas the practice we see moment they see some blood and all they try to start the blood and without realizing that blood is more harmful and this has been uh, told in the recent this one until 15 to 30% you can avoid it any comment on that dr ganesh mohan uh so uh, definitely uh, thank you and uh, the one area which uh, we tend to concentrate or focus on when the patient one is in the emergency department when the patient came after rta or uh, say referred uh, postpartum hemorrhage so the uh, establishing the patient vitals and exact physiological status may not be that uh, we don't have that much time at our hands so in general the activation of massive transfusion is more from an emergency team when we compare to uh, ot and icu because we have the patient under control and we can evaluate the patient more uh, so uh, the time we need to settle the patient establish the lines uh, establish uh, all the vitals send the samples for investigation get everything done uh, if the patient is not responding to fluids uh, say our atls guideline says we can try up to 1 uh, liter of crystal fluids before initiating uh, blood transfusion so they might go for one liter challenge and if the patient is not responding and patient is again uh, hemodynamically unstable and ongoing bleeding uh, we might switch over to blood transfusion uh, but whereas in ot in a controlled environment the patient even though the bleeding is more we may tend to uh, arrest the bleeding or we can switch over to um, balanced uh, resuscitation permissive hypotensions and other methods so that the bleeding is reduced or even providing clamps to other non vital arteries or veins so that the bleeding is reduced and then we can see how the patient is improving so there are two scenarios go, which goes in the same uh, patient if we consider so that's what i can i have to say to that i think others can also chip in any other any, other, any, any comments other. on that or in your practice whether uh, your observations that uh, when the loss is there the blood replacement so any comments you want to make on that any other concern dr kishori i think you are doing a lot of uh, this liver this and all no so well, i mean uh, the problem is you need, you need you as i said sir we 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 have to keep a low threshold but uh, uh, when in the especially major gastro surgery patient sent to become lot of hypotensive 
even if you give enough amount of fluids yeah 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 the blood because they they tend to become a little bit hard protein so we we uh, we end up finally we end up giving at least some amount of blood uh, uh, i don't know there, there, there is some uh, that's what i see in most major leo uh, this uh, gastro case and all even if the loss is as you said we allow up to 30% or even near to that self we find somehow you in spite of giving adequate fluid resuscitation even with colloids as well the bp tends to be on the lower side so yeah yeah you know these patients are all uh, in the late 60s 70s and uh, you need to that's what my observation i mean to again i i give very little blood i try to give very little blood but sometimes you end up even after as you sir said replacing with fluids that's my take on it probably um, i don't know that is one because our agents and epidurals and everything may be contributing to the hypotensive aspect it's not only the fluids of blood so but that's what i find thank you actually well said that restrictive blood uh, transfusion practice that is what we have to keep in mind and always most of the times we think about the safety and uh, in that uh, crucial uh, time and all we go for this one so keeping the like uh, minimum whatever that is available and there was some question actually uh, what is the indication for whole blood in the our country presently what is the rationale or indication because many of the surgeons are still ordering for whole blood so there was a question about this who wants to take this question i will take it sir yeah please uh, so in our country in most of the times if uh, we have the resources we are practicing 100% component therapy if we don't have that we might end up using whole blood which is yeah. again wasting a lot of uh, precious blood compounds for example like platelets or uh, plasma so uh, that is one thing and second thing is uh, we do practice reconstituted whole blood only in one scenario which is exchange transfusion in pediatrics uh, for uh, uh, hyperbilirubinemia so that is the only clinical indication where we use that is also reconstituted whole blood apart from that we don't practice or we don't advise using whole blood in our country yeah thank you eh? yeah. Yeah. anybody else sir? yes sir yes. Uh, uh, there are reports of uh, military practice wherein yeah. they have used uh, uh, fresh uh, blood fresh whole blood fresh that that means uh, less than 8 uh, hours or even 24 hours uh, fresh because uh, they don't have the availability of uh, components uh, but uh, i don't think it, uh, it did not be extrapolated to the civilian practice uh, as in other guidelines because uh, we have availability of uh, uh, components and uh, as uh, dr uh, dr ganesh mohan said uh, the only existing indications may be in the neonatal exchange transfusions and uh, probably neonatal hemodialysis dialysis and uh, yeah so uh, thank you the there was one this one that autologous is uh, transfusion is practiced in cardiac surgeries i do remember in some centers that a patient is told and uh, to come well in advance and they do collect the blood in cardiac centers but what they have commented it is tough to collect with the central lines with the regard to this uh, blood i mean maybe the acute normolemic hemodilution induction and you collect the blood they are written comment that it is tough to collect through the central lines any comment you want to make anybody anybody in the panel sorry sir any any that uh, the, collect the blood from the central line no, 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 i was in mentioning about collecting blood through central line i was yeah. uh, once you put a central line you can replace your fluid through the central line we usually take from the cubital vein with the uh, blood bags the needle co- which comes with the blood bag that's what i used to do we put that uh, large bore needle into the cubital vein and take it that's fine that's fine actually one more comment they have made is actually it is true that uh, fresh frozen plasma uh, this uh, is used for albumin replacement and uh, still practiced any comment on that actually, well, I, i think it shouldn't be encouraged sir. i don't i don't think it should be encouraged there is yeah, not be used for, there is no role for albumin for uh, volume replacement that is true actually yeah so it should not be used and the other thing is uh, this um, trolley that is a transmission induced uh, lung injury 
and it's a hidden uh, component in post op and the icu outcome uh, anybody who wants to comment on that probably yeah. one area we never look at sir i don't i we we, we don't attribute many of our post operative uh, sort of lung complications we never never consider trialy as a first choice we we used to uh, point fingers at something else like uh, sepsis or but i think it's pr pretty common and uh, uh, there is another i mean that's that's what i think probably trial trial is not as common also as reports find in the western world i think i don't know maybe, maybe ganesh mohan can answer that i find trial is it is it that common as reporter in studies ganesh yes sir yes sir we have a national hemovigilance program in india which is running for the last 6 years and even in that 6 years report we don't find that much amount of a tally reported nationally i'm saying national statistics not from one particular center or one state so i think it is if we compare that national statistics to uk short report or abb american uh, reports there is a general tendency that it might be under reported or uh, overlooked in most of the patients because uh, we might seldom diagnose because of the existing other conditions so there is a tendency that we may overlook trally in icu setups and especially in uh, ot also so apart from that data wise uh, we have very few very few trally cases yeah that's true we we, we under report and we don't look for it i think and uh, that's why the stats are very low compared to what the literature says actually i have the statistics which shows uh, trally is seen one in uh, 12000 maybe these are all western reports it is seen that like that and they also have reported like uh, this uh, anaphylactic reactions hemolytic reactions and all what is seen the acute that is seen less than 1 in 2 millions actually and they have compared and said the chance of uh, from the lightning strike it is less like 1 in 100 of lakhs there is a chance so when you compare that it is very rare mild reactions and all are there but the fatal reaction it is uh, luckily for us it is very very rare and uh, anyhow now since it is a covid scenario i think uh, dr vijesh ven gopal and dr vijesh told actually uh, in his presentation touched on that everybody is concerned and with regard to the blood donation also i think dr ganesh mohan there is uh, too much of uh, uh, maybe shortage with the blood donors yes. in this covid era so yes. do you want to make because everybody is concerned with the transfusion particularly with the asymptomatic patients so how to overcome or any this one it has really affected the maybe the practice i feel yes sir uh, of course uh, for the last one years one year we were uh, there are two aspect to it one is the donor aspect as uh, dr vijay uh, sir uh, already told the donor might be afraid to come to the hospital uh, in fear that they might get covid uh, and during the lockdown times and even now when the cases are soaring high they will not come to the hospital and we can conduct blood donation drives outside the hospital so the donor aspect the blood collection aspect is hit severely and plus the vaccination drive which is going on so our most uh, heavy number of donors are belonging to 18 to 45 age group so if they go for a large vaccination drive again the number of donors will come down on the other hand when we consider the patients uh, even if an asymptomatic person donates blood Uh, there are no studies as of now which says not even covid uh, sars cov2 even uh, sars and mers cov uh, these viruses have not found these are all one family of viruses these viruses have not found uh, transmitted from blood to another patient even if the uh, blood had uh, viral rna particles present in it uh, but in specific to covid19 we don't have that much uh, of study which in vitro studies which says if we give this blood containing viral rna the person might get we don't have that much data but the latest data which came out uh, two weeks back it says uh, they have studied 14000 donors during the covid time and 23 percentage of them had uh, nasal swab positive immediately after the donor donation or uh, within 7 days of donation and 3 percentage of them had viral rna particles present in their blood but none of the patient developed covid who to whom or they have given unknowingly none of the patient had developed covid so if we consider the patient part uh, we have to assume that it is safe to transfuse even if we collect blood from asymptomatic donor 
but the other part the inventory maintaining part uh, which is hit uh, very badly because of covid so uh, <coughs> thank you dr ganesh mohan and uh, now that the time is running out i think anyhow one more thing i want to stress is it is already touched up on hypothermia and it has been said any 1 degree centigrade drop can increase the blood loss by 20% so that means that uh, most of the patients the temperature maintenance with the warmers and all is a must if you want to minimize the blood loss and uh, each of the panelists you have done excellently and uh, really your presentation was very good you have made uh, the topic very simple and easily digestible with all the people um postgraduates as well as the practicing anesthesiologists anybody else wants to add anything finally before anybody has anything to this thank you thank you amresha for conducting the show thank you sir yeah i request dr jayashree to say thanks to all and say good night good evening everybody it was a pleasure and listening to our webinar today Dr. Amrish, it was a pleasure to see you after so many years. Thank you, <laughs> very very nice. back. <laughs> yes, that's very nice. Excellent. And uh, I must compliment um, the topics that are chosen by the various ICA members, and this one was excellent. And it was so nice that uh, non-anesthesiologist members, you know, Dr. Ganesh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kishore. they were all here and they had sure is anesthesiologist madam <laughs> no no <laughs> no acha he is the head of liver transplant anyway yeah. <laughs> okay yeah. so at least ganesh mohan and uh, he did such a i mean it was so interesting to hear the uh, top uh, the the clarifications given from him and thank you so much uh, dr ambrish dr ganesh dr vijesh rajesh and kishore thank you very much and to all the audience as well and hope to see you next week on another webinar which will be on the advanced cardiac life support thank you very much and good night everybody thank, thank you, you madam thank you very much ma'am thank you very much thank, thank you all of you thank you thank you thank you thank you all thank you dr sanish yes thank always you. sanish is of course <laughs> sanish <laughs> and rakesh is our back oh. <laughs> rakesh now yeah yeah okay. <laughs> and rakesh also thank you no